family friendly activities. Each and every year I look forward to our summer movie night series here at the Hanson Dam Aquatic Center. This is the largest municipal pool in the country and we're so fortunate to have it here under the hot San Fernando Valley sun, uh, this wonderful sandy beach. Finding Nemo, uh, we did this last year. And Council Member Hutt, absent. Council Member Hernandez. Present. Council Member Park. Present. Five members present and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good, thank you very much. Um, members, this is now the 11th meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. Um, and uh, as you know, we have uh, spent most of those meetings working on redistricting reform and the possibility of uh, reducing council district size. Um, and we'll continue that discussion today and hopefully uh, bring to um, some con some degree of conclusion the recommendations that uh, have been discussed uh, from the various groups that have presented to us as well as our, our CLA. Uh, we do have translation services available today uh, for anyone who needs it. Um, so if you need Spanish translation, um, it, it is available for you. Um, Madam Clerk, any announcements for the committee today? Thank you. In addition, the Spanish translation will be broadcast live on the YouTube channel. Very good. Thank you. Um, so after concluding our listening sessions, after hearing the reports from uh, academia, from community organizations, um, and, as well as the, the CLA, uh, we, we have before us what we've colloquial referred, colloquially referred to as the rack up. And uh, for members, if you'll remember, as we go through our budget cycle, this is similar to what we do with the budget, where we have um, extensive detailed recommendations, and then we go through it page by page, um, or section by section, as may be the case here, and we try to bring the consensus of the committee uh, to, to conclusion. So the idea is we're going to, I'm going to have, after public comment, I'm going to have Mr. Wickham come forward and present the rack up to us, section by section. We'll have an opportunity to, to debate and discuss. Uh, and then we'll come up with our recommendations in each section. We'll come back at the end and take an overall vote uh, to approve our collective recommendations. And then uh, the CLA will take those recommendations and begin the process of, of putting them into a form that can be transmitted to the council. Part of the point of this is that we want to give um, at the month between now and the council meeting where this will come back, which will be on September 8th, well, not quite a month. Um, uh, we'll, yeah, well, it will be, because we'll come back to this committee on September 18th with the CLA's uh, completed report. Um, so between now and September 18th, the public will have an opportunity to hear what we're recommending and comment back on that. Um, I'm going to ask that the CLA, after today, also ask all of the presenting groups and everyone else in the community who wishes to, to comment to provide their comments on our recommendations from today so that we can take those into account on September 18th as well. We'll then vote out recommendations for the council and it'll be, it, we'll have additional time then for more public input between that meeting and the council meeting when it'll be taken up. So it's my hope that by doing that we can focus a very broad discussion about many, many issues that were all impacted by this concept of independent redistricting. We, we can condense that down into some actual <coughs> tangible recommendations that the public will have an opportunity to, to analyze and discuss as well. Um, so I again want to take a moment before we begin to thank uh, all of the um, members of the community and uh, the experts and activists and uh, so many others who've been involved in the dialogue that we've had to date. Um, I hope that you'll find that that has been a productive dialogue in moving us forward with the recommendations that we're going to move forward uh, today. And I want to thank, of course, the committee staff and all of you members and your staffs as well and for everybody who makes it possible for us to have these meetings in City Hall. Uh, so with that, um, uh, 
Madam Clerk, if you could call item number one. And uh, actually, before you do, I, I'm just going to begin with <clears throat> public comment first, and then we'll call Mr. Uh, Wickham to the, the table. So any questions, comments, members, before we begin with public comment? Councilmember okay. Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Just to confirm, we are voting today then. And yeah, can you just make clear one more time what we're actually voting on today? Sure. So uh, Mr. Wickham's going to go through this, this report. Up. And section by section, he has, you know, sort of the, the decision matrix again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to vote on each of those recommendations. If we can't come to consensus, we can't. But I hope that on most of these issues, we'll have, um, you know, a, a majority consensus. Um, then at the end of that, after we've completed the whole thing, we'll take one final vote on the recommendations. Um, and that will then be prepared in a format that will come back to us, this committee, on September 18th. So we'll have opportunity to change it further mm -hmm. between now and September 18th if we choose. Okay. If we're informed, you know, if we hear things from the public on these recommendations that cause us to think that amendments or tweaks are necessary, we can do that at our meeting of September 18th. And then the, after that meeting, will vote on a recommendation for council. And okay. then the council will uh, obviously make its ultimate decision. Great, thank you for that clarification. My pleasure. Yeah. Mr. Blumenfield. And, and obviously there, there's some issues that are not reflected in this matrix <coughs> that we can bring up today, I assume. Yeah. Um, and then there's the whole other question of the school board, which we haven't really touched on, but is, is part of our purview as well. And exactly right. And there will be additional issues, I'm sure, that we'll think of between now and the time that council votes as well. Um, so my, my goal here is to get as many things off of our plate as we can uh, without any expectation that we are going to complete 100% of our work today. I, I don't think that's, uh, that's going to happen. But I want to get as much of that decided as we can so that in fairness, the public has something that they can actually look at and say, that's a good idea, that's not a good idea, and, and, or do this differently. That's part of the point of this. Part of the, the other point of it is exactly as you've said, the more we get moved off of the plate, the more we can focus then our attention on what still remains to be done. Okay. Okay, any other comments or questions, members? Okay. Uh, and. Um, the record should reflect that I, I don't remember uh, if when we called roll they were here, but Mr. Harris Dawson and Councilmember Hutt are both here um, for public comment. All right, so let's go ahead and um, begin with public comment, starting with, oh, uh, Mr. City Attorney, did you want to read in any instructions? It, very simple. This is a special meeting with one agenda item, so you have one minute to speak. Uh, there is no general public comment because it's special. So um, the public should just speak to the item, which is the uh, Independent Redistricting Commission, the possible, possible expansion of the council. That's all. Very good. Thank you. We'll start with Andrew Grabner, Carolina Goodman, Donald Harlan, Godfrey Plata, and Jen Goody, please. All right, so I usually don't even go to these meetings anymore because it's just a joke and we're, you're not even going to do any reform. Um, it's so clear um, that that's what's going to happen here. The, the proposal is absolutely terrible. You literally want to leave the same district lines that Nuri and Gil and KDL and Ron Herrera and whoever else was involved in that drew last time until 2032. Like... We need to change the, at minimum, you should be, you know, changing them with the 2026 election or something and just having a vote on all the new district lines. But, but you just want to leave it until 2032. Um, because, and we all know why, because again, you don't want any accountability for what happens. And if you change them now, then their district lines won't survive until then. Um, you're going to have Kevin DeLeon literally involved in all this process. Um, you know, we need a, this probably, it shouldn't even probably be the council that's deciding what the new proposal is. I mean, come on. Next speaker, please.
Good morning. Good morning, council members. Carolina Goodman, CD4, League of Women Voters of Greater Los Angeles, and member of the Fair Rep LA Coalition. Um, starting with Section D, independent entity needs to be the one to sort the applications in order to make in, in order to d decide the most qualified, not the city clerk. Again, in Section D, of course, we support a complete ban on ex parte communications, except regarding administrative matters. This should include consultants as well as commissioners. In Section J1, we need a protected budget, just like the state of California. In Section K7, not only should the commission have independent counsel, it should also have access to an independent VRA counsel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good morning, council members and CLA. Um, Godfrey Plata, he, him, uh, today representing uh, the many community leaders who are here on behalf of the API community, and in particular, Koreatown, that were here on August 10th um, that met with Councilmember Hutt on August 9th, um, the day before, many of which are members of API Equity Alliance as well. Um, we noticed over the weekend that the CLA report spends a lot of time on the 2032 possibility for implementation, and we want to note that we'd love to reiterate a desire to flesh out the 2026 implementation possibilities as well. Um, we know that 2026 would recognize the urgency coming out of the leaked audio, uh, which point to how our districts might be compromised. Uh, we know that 2032 would be 10 years after the audio was leaked um, and would not signal the urgency that community would like to see from council to rebuild trust with the public. Um, and it's also ahead enough of the regular census redistricting uh, at the turn of the decade. Um, and we know we wouldn't want to get closer to 2030 um, to, to mix that up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please, and Mr. as Mr. Harlan is coming up, I'd like to call a few more names. Jen Goody, Nikolai Eitner, Rob Kwan, Ross Weistroffer, and Stacy Cigar Bollinger, please. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Donald Harlan. I'm speaking on this uh, attempt to create city council seats and redistrict. Uh, there is no redistricting needed for political purposes for City council seats, they're my cities. Los Angeles is my city. You guys aren't to be paying yourselves, trying to do stuff. If you need to uh, uh, run services in some other part of the city area, that's just fine, put them to work, but you shouldn't be encouraging neighborhood councils to develop. Uh, there's nobody in the city of Los Angeles at the city council or anywhere in the, any level of the government that has authority to create city council seats. There's only eight city council seats. Uh, there's no redistricting necessary. Uh, it should be divided that way into eight segments. It's my city, that's my property, those are my cities. You guys shouldn't be paying yourself extra or making deals. Uh, nobody should show up like that. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, committee members. I am Ross Weistroff, a resident of CD4. LA is a busy city, and time is the money that we all need to survive here, which is why I worked this weekend, to survive. And I tried to fit in reading the CLA's recommendations, but I couldn't get past the part in the first few pages where we might need to wait until 2032 for newly drawn districts to be on the ballot when the districts that we live with now are tainted and unrepresentative. And the science is clear. According to professors Michael Lautner et al., in a survey of 159 cities, multi-seat districts and larger assemblies produce the diverse racial representation our city needs. Please don't wait, waste busy Angelino's time in giving us the transparent and representative democracy we deserve. Ensure new districts and a bigger council with at-large membership are on our ballots by 2026, not nine years from now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Rob Kwan, this new CLA's report offers us perfect clarity on what direction we need to go in. Unfortunately, that direction is disbanding this committee and starting over with a car charter commission. 
Let's be clear. Anyone pointing to 2032 implementation is advocating for the preservation of Nuri's maps that were rigged to disenfranchise communities across the city. They're advocating for a system of governments that is proven hopelessly corrupt and incapable of repre re representing this city or responding to our problems. If justice delayed is justice denied, then what is justice delayed 10 years? What is justice delayed 10 years? We have somehow gotten to an IRC plan that is worse than what the state of California uses and worse than what California is trying to impose on us. I know you abhor the First Amendment, but how do you think the Supreme Court is going to respond to a proposal that allows incumbents extra speaking time, but not their challengers? Everyone and their mother told you to get this decision making out of the city clerk's hands and into the Ethics Commission. And what do you do? Thank you. Put it back in a political pointing's Thank hands. You. Next speaker, please. Hi. Um, I think you all know who I am. Uh, so this, these suggestions are very detailed and specific, but as everyone has mentioned, um, keeping the current maps and pretending like we're doing anything for governance reform is a joke. Um, there should have been action to nullify the current maps we're under the second that audio was released to the public and you all became publicly aware of the motives behind the way that map was drawn. Um, but I, I think that it's not really so secret that y'all work together behind the scenes on those things. So it's no wonder. And there's a lot of criteria laid out here for um, potential commission appointments for the commission you want to create. I think we all know, based on how you treated Jamie York, the only criteria for a commission is that you like them before they come up for you. Next speaker, please. Afternoon. My name is Nikola, and we have a lot to cover in the next 55 seconds. I'm a member of the Fair Rep LA Coalition, speaking today on my own behalf. Um, our coalition, whose work I have been honored to be a part of, includes Los Angeles for All, the League of Women Voters of Greater Los Angeles, Los Angeles for Democracy Vouchers, Ground Game LA, Mar Vista Voice, Abundant Housing LA, Unrig LA, Cal RCV, Citizens Take Action, the LA Forward Institute, and represent us. Despite advocating around these charter reform issues since the last redistricting cycle and creating a package of 28 consensus-based coalition recommendations, and when we signed up for time to present to this committee, it turned out that we could not be accommodated. Neither were our recommendations mentioned or even seemingly considered in this final CLA report. Yet despite many of this committee's early meetings being attended almost exclusively by members of our coalition, you pat yourselves on the back for successful community engagement while prohibiting remote public comment. The issue I would like to draw attention to is the striking of decision C6 in the CLA's report, which would have pursued implementation of expansion and redistricting for the 2026 elections. It is absurd to expect Angelinos to wait a decade from the implementation of tainted district maps and eight years Thank from you. charter amendment vote to see the equitable and responsive representative and representative local government that Angelinos deserve right now. Thank you. Last call for Jen Goody. All right, that's all the speakers that I have who've signed up. Is there anybody else who wished to offer comment? Okay, uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, close public comment and invite Mr. Wickham to come on up to the table, please. Mr. Wickham, good morning. Good morning, members. Um, Glad to be here. And um, so I understand we will go through the rack up that we had provided for you. Um, I, under, I recognize there's a great deal of detail in here. In preparing the rack up, we went through um, all of the information that was considered in your hearings. You held uh, eight hearings, went through a lot of conversation, discussion on the various issues that we had identified covering redistricting. We considered um, the, the sense of the committee in those conversations. We evaluated the information received in the public hearings. We also um, took information from the reports provided by the Los Angeles Governance Reform Project, Common Cause, and our LA. 
which um, who all provided a great deal of detail and information on their thoughts on these issues. We tried to pull them all together and in the rack up in some way that um, is helpful and provide some direction. I want to emphasize that because we, we worked on the words um, thoughtfully, we tried to be thoughtful in the way we presented this in, in the rack up. We call it a suggested term sheet. We don't want to suggest that it's a proposal. We don't want to suggest that it's a recommendation. The, the eight hearings you held had all of the issues open without any preference in any direction, shape, or form. Um, it was a, a broad discussion that you held with the community in those hearings and, and um, without having anything as a guidepost. So we brought this suggested term sheet forward for you as a way to um, bring together some of the key issues. There was some consensus on things. There was some things where we had no idea what you um, really wanted to do at the end of the day. And so we've tried to present that to you here in a way to help guide the conversation going forward. So um, the suggested terms are not set in stone. They're not even set in wet cement. Right. This is entirely policy conversation for you to continue, um, but it provides a guide. Guide it will provide us better guidance on how to move forward in, in the next iteration of the, this report. Which um, so uh, the results of today's meeting, we will take that information back. We will refine the document, and then we will, as Mr. Chair, you pointed out, we will bring that back on September 18th. Um, uh, again, I'm very grateful for the uh, reports that were provided by the outside groups. Um, they, if I missed a detail or a nuance in what they prepared, I apologize for that. We were trying to bring lots of different ideas together in a way that had a common language to it. And sometimes um, in doing that succinctly, we might um, miss a nuance and, or a detail. And, and, and I do apologize for that. That was not our intention. So. Um, at this point, uh, I think, um, Mr. Chair, what we would like to do is go through the redistricting rack up, and if you'd like to go through that page by page, um, of course, we start out with the biggest question, one of the biggest questions that's in front of you on the first page, which is the size of the council. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to just dig into that one right now, we can do that. And yeah, it would have been nice if we could, could have gotten warmed up a little bit first, <laughs> but uh, so we had a, we've had a lot of discussion about this topic already. Um, I, I think um, when we were discussing it among ourselves, there was a lot of discussions of pluses and minuses of a relatively modest increase in the number of seats all the way up to a very dramatic uh, increase in the number of seats. We did get... Um, the reports back uh, that suggest a you know direction to me uh, it, it seems like in the in the mid 20s it seems to be where people were uh, where the groups were kind of suggesting there was this issue of at large seats as well and whether or not that should be uh, part of this calculation so um, members based on what we have before us now um, would anybody like to uh, weigh in on this or make a suggestion? So um, if I could add a little bit more information. Um, first off, I would say that in the public hearing at Exposition Park in particular was very rich. Um, the public comment received at that committee um, was very helpful and there was a, a great deal of information that was provided there. Um, the preponderance of the hearing there was a preference for a fixed number rather than a methodology based that where every 10 years the number would shift based on population. Um, the common cause recommendation is that the population should shift every 10 years based on population. Um, so those are, that's one question of how you would um, set the number of districts. Would it be a fixed number? Would it shift every 10 years based on population? And then the question, if it's a fixed number, what is the fixed number? So uh, one of the things that I found compelling the last time we were together was uh, our LA's discussion about um, a range of size that would, 
according to their data analysis, would maximize the opportunity for the broadest range of representation. Uh, they had suggested between 23 and 31. Um, the academic groups uh, recommended uh, 21 plus the four at large. So um, as a starting point, um, those I think are, are guideposts for our discussion. Mr. Blumenfield. Well, I, I guess weighing in on the question of should the numbers change with the population, uh, I'm reluctant to do that. I think that that is very disruptive in terms of all the infrastructure that gets built around these offices. Um, so I think we, we do raise the number, but uh, I'm concerned about putting in an inflator and a deflator and, you know, putting aside the, how you make the desks and all that stuff. There's a lot of other very real things that, that go into that. Um, so I'm comfortable with, a, with setting a number and sticking with that number until the next charter change. And I would add to that that whatever that number is, whatever it is, triggers a lot of other things in the charter. For example, one of our next issues we have to decide, what is the threshold by which the council can override a mayoral veto? Um, if you have an automatic adjuster, you know, that section of the charter would have to change too. And th there are many other things like that that are impacted. W you know, what's a quorum? There, there, there's, um, it, it, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the unintended consequences that we're not anticipating that might happen if we had an adjustment of two seats more or two seats less in 15 years uh, that, um, that none of us are really thinking about yeah. at this point. Uh, or, or would have any way to anticipate. So, yeah, I, I, my, my preference would be to stick with whatever number we pick until such time as the voters and a future council decide that's not working best for them, and then they can change it again if they choose. Um, let's start with this. How about, why don't we take this a piece at a time? Um, so, is there, any thought, do we have any thoughts about the idea of the four at-large seats that were proposed by uh, the governance reform project, the academic uh, group? Councilmember Hernandez. Um, Mr. Wickman, it says that state law has been not in favor of at-large seats. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Um, I'll do my best. Thank yes, you. Uh, state law, I mean, cities across the state, there are over 400 cities in the state of California, and general law cities in particular have been um, the generally five members in, a, in the city council, and they're at large, so it's across the entire city, there are no districts. Recently, state law has changed to say that if there is any evidence of um, polarized voting in the jurisdiction that they need to move to elections by district. And so that's a clear statement, I think, from the state legislature that they have um, strengthened over the last few years in refinements to the California Election Code and the California Fair Maps Act um, to show that there is um, uh, a concern about polarized voting in the state and that if that is the case that districts are the solution to address that. So this whole concept of having at-large districts of some sort um, really is not in favor of the direction that we're seeing from the state. Um, we just had a, we just actually last week had um, a decision against the city of Santa Monica that was fighting moving to at, di um, at districts away from at large. Santa Monica will have to go to district elections going forward. So we're seeing in the legislature and in the courts that at large districts are, are not preferable. Great, thank you. And in that Santa Monica case, uh, I just saw language uh, from the decision, the California Supreme Court opinion in that, which said, unlike its federal analog, the California Voting Rights Act prohibits the use of an at-large electoral system that dilutes not only the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of its choice, 
but also its ability to influence the outcome of, a, of an election. Um, and then it goes on, the inclusion of the latter phrase, blah, blah. blah. Um, there is no additional requirement that the protected class constitute a majority or near majority of a hypothetical district. So one could probably argue and probably groups in the future would argue that by having a council that consists of some number of smaller district seats and some number of at-large seats, that would have the effect of diluting the ability of um, diluting the ability of um, a protected class to influence the outcome of an election. So um, I, I, yes. I think that language kind of sinks our ability to use any at-large seats, whether it's an at-large system or you know some combination system. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah. Well, certainly, my own view, if we, if we did at-large, I would want to see them as regional at-large, not at-large, at-large, not another citywide elected office. But, but even regional seats would have the same legal issue that you're talking about in terms of one person, one vote, and how that plays out. Although there are other cities. Are, aren't there not other cities in California that do this? Not that we know of in California. In, um, I think Houston and Philadelphia are the examples that have been identified. There may be a few others. Yeah, well, I know there's a bunch. I mean, Detroit, uh, there's a lot of cities that do have uh, district and at large. Yeah. Um, I know from throughout the country. I don't know off the top of my head any in California. Yeah, we, we don't know of any in California. And I think it also creates um, issues uh, with regard to decision making. So if I, if I live in a district and I don't get the answer from one elected official who's my regional member, I can go to my district member. If I don't get the answer from my district member, I can go to my regional member. I think there's lots of opportunity for game playing in the votes that create ambiguities in decision making process and the policy setting process that would be problematic. Certainly in a, in a hybrid environment where we're both executive and legislative branch to some extent as we are in LA, unlike a lot of other cities, uh, that's true. But the, as we move toward a larger number, we are also moving toward a more legislative than, than executive branch. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I, I don't know. It, it cuts both ways. There's good and bad to having that, that ambiguity. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Councilmember Hutt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's my understanding that multi-member districts are a violation of state and government code. Is that show? Is that true? Should we be researching that? Um, we haven't looked at multiple member districts, but I think there there could be similar concerns in that. Or we would have to look at that. Um, the, I think there are ways that you would have to run the elections that would be very different, uh, and. Currently, state law doesn't would not allow for those kinds of election um, procedures. Um, it relates to the election systems that are approved by the state and how those are implemented in the county of Los Angeles. So I think we would need to see changes in state law and in county operations in order to allow for multi-member districts to begin with. And then I think you would also get into issues, again, about dilution of, of voting. Um, it, it would, that we would have to analyze a little more closely. Thank you. Any other thoughts on, on the number members? Uh, to to oh, me, I have okay. sorry, Councilmember Hutt? I'll, I'll wait till Bob go. I'll, I'll wait for him. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. In, in, um, Looking at the numbers, I'm really concerned about black representation. I'll just say it. I feel like uh, we have a greater opportunity for more representation if we look at reasonable numbers that some of the organizations have identified without the at-large piece. I'll just add my two cents. And, and the, the Our LA presentation spoke Right. I, I think uh, to that point and you know was based on a degree of data analysis which I you know really thought was was welcome uh, it's, it, 
for similar reasons, I, just for discussion purposes, um, I think that something in the 23 range hits the concerns that have been expressed to us well. Um, it, it's within that range that our LA recommended. It's close to the what was recommended by uh, the governance reform project academics. You know, it's sort of in between. And if we don't do the at-large seats, um, it kind of splits the difference between those two. Um, it would bring the size of our districts down under 175,000 people per district, uh, which would be certainly a welcome change. Um, I, I'm feeling like that's kind of the sweet spot area. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Mr. Wickman, do you have any sense of where the threshold is, where we would start becoming more legislative and less executive? What the, what the number you think is that threshold? Um, I think we would need to do a little bit more analysis of some of those factors. The, the question is more the balance between the, um, the executive role, which is clearly the mayor, and then the legislative role that you have. And um, where in that relationship there starts to be more of a transfer of authorities over to the mayor as a result of what the structure is. I think we would have to look at w how those numbers play out. Um, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a complicated, I don't quite know how to measure that. I'd have to have some other conversations with some experts on whether a higher, it, it feels like a higher number. I mean, when people were talking about the 50s, I think we were really getting into a situation where um, you might see some dilution, significant dilution of the legislative um, role. Um, but in this range where um, 23, 25, you're probably closer to maintaining that balance in a more effective way. Great, thank you. Um, do you see around 23, that number um, that we're talking about now, do you see any potential impacts on the like status of the council member's time? Do you think that at 23 would be put to part-time? I uh, haven't, haven't given that some consideration. I think it is a question of what the what, um, responsibilities are for the council. And, um, you know, as the point is, if there are 260,000 residents, I don't know if there's a direct correlation between the number of people and the, and, the, and the representative or the number of people and the representative plus their staff, um, where all of that kind of comes together. And then some of the work that you're doing is in person, you know, is in person related. It's, you know, number of side, you know, length of sidewalks or streets or um, number of facilities that are, I mean, it's a range of services and policies that are working together that are driving your, um, your workload. And then the priorities that you set as an elected official that drive your workload. Um, and the degree of engagement you have with your mem with the residents of your district. Um, so it's a it's a difficult calculation, I think. Great, thank you. And the only reason why I ask is because I've uh, have colleagues out throughout the country who are part time, and it's just the, they're not able to meet their constituent needs, and so it's just really difficult. So just wanted that clarity. But thank you. Yeah, and as I mentioned, mo most of the cities in the state of California are. They're, they're part time, they, they have a limited time that they meet. And they're much smaller, they have much smaller um, populations that they represent. Sig Los Angeles is significantly different. And so, yeah, so that, that point, I think, of where you're in the mid-20 range, you're still serving a significant number of people, as Mr. Cochrane mentioned, that's around 150, 170,000 people. Great, thank you, Mr. Wickman. And I think one of the reasons that that uh, relationship is complicated is because that this whole idea that the council has you know some executive power is is really just uh, it, it's it's the result of having to fill a vacuum it's it's not 
anything that's provided in the charter per se. It's that when we're f having to fight for limited resources for each of our districts, we have to take on that role too often of demanding services, you know, for our district. And so whether it's 15 members or 23 or, or 30, I, you know, that's not fundamentally going to change the basic issue that we still have to fight for our, you know, districts to make sure that services are delivered. I will say, though, if you go in the other direction, you know, I mean, you look at the county, I, I get that it's completely different because they don't have a mayor, but the county with five supervisors representing two million people, if a supervisor says do that, it happens, you know. Um, but I don't think we want to move in in that direction because it would defeat all the other issues that we have of access and you know encouraging a more democratic process. Um, so how we figure out this balance of power stuff may be independent of selection of the number. It it will be influenced by the number for sure. I think to your point, if we had if we had sixty members, no general manager would really have to listen to any council member. Um, yeah, but so that's why this this is a little tricky because it's 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 informal. You know, it's not really anything that that we have that's expressed. Councilmember Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, just on the the topic of the number of council districts generally, um, regardless of what the number is that we land on. There are a few issues and concerns that remain outstanding for me. And yes, we've had some discussion around them, but I've not actually seen any numbers or projections. Um, and, and I'll just briefly mention those, but one relates to a discussion that we had recently, and that is on delivery of services and how our council districts are managed. And, you know, if our staffs are going to be cut in half, are we solving for the problem of better representation and management of our council districts and and i don't have any analysis in front of me or real hard information on which to make a decision about that um, also with respects to the costs generally of what it would mean uh, in terms of building out a larger infrastructure for council and then Another outstanding piece of this for me is what the impacts are going to be on other city departments and their budgets. Fifteen of us put an incredible amount of demand on city staff and department time, and I have some concerns about that going forward. So all of those remain as, you know, we've, we've had discussion about them, but I, I, I still don't have any real data or information that I can sink my teeth into to make an informed decision about what those impacts are going to be. And for me, my priority is staffing up our city departments so that we can deliver the constituent services that we need. Yeah. Yep. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And thank you, uh, Mr. Wickham. Uh, incredible work on this over a long period of time, very thorny issues thorny set of issues. Uh, I appreciate the comments of all the members uh, and especially uh, want to associate myself with the comments of Ms. Park. Um, the Do you have, uh, and let me just confess a, a point of view on this that'll give context to my questions. Um, I get concerned about picking out pieces of the charter and changing them without thinking about the thing as a whole. So chair raised like, well, what does this do to quorum? And what, and Mr. Blue and Phil raised, what does this do to the seats? And, and I just, so I worry about that. Um, um, I also get concerned because I don't know quite how to articulate this, but I, I haven't seen a city raise their hand and say, well, we have the perfect number. <laughs> like this is ideal. Um, and, and I just, that concerns me as well, um, that when you have 23, there are going to be as many people unhappy as when you have 15, or if you have 25, there will be as many people unhappy as when you have 23. I just haven't seen the comparative that makes the case that, oh, yes, this is substantially better than what you have. So, that, so I'll confess those uh, points of view. But on the question of size, do you feel like you have an exhaustive set of eventualities that have to be considered? 
or do you feel like that's a that by itself is another process? So members raise some here, you raise some, there's some in the document, but do you feel like that's exhaustive? Like you raise it to 23, let's just take 23 as the number. Here are all, here's an exhaustive list of the implications to the charter, the implications to the logistics, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so we worry about we worry about that too, and we keep iteratively going through these conversations to see if we can identify other issues or concerns. I don't think anybody could have an exhaustive list because people have um, an ability to be creative. So that once you figured out everything, somebody will come up either before or afterward, or once you've created a new structure, somebody will decide, oh, hey, wait a minute, I could try and do this, and then they'll run with it. So, you know, people are creative, and that's cool, right? Um, so, but we're doing everything we can to identify and have these conversations as a way to um, pull out any issues that we think are significant and relevant. There are a number of them that are consequences that aren't, rel that aren't critical, right? You will wind up changing this, doesn't really matter, right? So there's that part of the equation too. Um, to Ms. Park's con uh, concerns, I think that it's hard to do an analysis when we don't know where the number's gonna be or we don't even know the neighborhood of the number because if it's gonna change every 10 years, that's gonna be one set of consequences cons um, compared to there's the number is 50 or the number is 23. So if we win, we have better direction from the committee of, the, of where you think the neighborhood is, we would have a better sense of how to um, hone in on some of those um, impacts on departments, on services, on costs, on council. Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, and oh, oh, I'm sorry. Were you done, Mr. Hirsch? Just one more, one more question. Um, so we, um, you know, the voting rights addresses racially uh, polarized districts um, in, I think, a pretty thorough way, both California um, and the, the U.S. Voting Rights Acts. Um, one of the concerns I have is um, class pol polarization. So the, the way we have it now, um, most, the vast majority of very, very low income neighborhoods also have either middle income or upper middle income, income neighborhoods in their districts, right? Um, and so there's a balance and you don't have a situation where a district is an entirely low income district, right? Um, that was especially true uh, before redistricting in 2010 or 2012. Um, the ninth district was impacted in, in, in a way that produced something close to that. Um, is there a way for us to control for that? That would be, well, it is the redistricting process to include communities of interest and community of interest would be um, issues uh, such as you're raising. If there are more districts, then you have the ability to include, you know, draw boundaries in a way that are going to um, uh, align those kinds of economic interests um, in a different way than we do now. As you say, the, the districts are, because of the size of the population of the districts, you do wind up needing to draw in broader geographic areas. If you're gonna have some um, more districts, the geographic areas are gonna be smaller, the populations are gonna be smaller, and you would, you would have a chance who, you know, I don't know, I, I'm not drawing the maps, I don't have data in front of me to say this, but there is, um, there may be ways to draw maps that are going to have those kinds of economic interests uh, um, aligned in different ways than we do now. Got it, thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilman Rubin. Yeah, first, before I get to my question, just building on what Mr. Harris Dawson said, I mean, it cuts, cuts both ways depending on how you, you know, if you, define those districts and you have a low income district or a high income district, that has benefits, you have an advocate, but 
that also has downsides in that you don't have, you know, someone who can see all sides and you, you don't have uh, that diversity. I mean, I, I like having my district where I have some very uh, needy areas and some very wealthy areas. Um, it gives me more of the freedom to, to try to really focus on, on the issues. Um, my question, though, was, has to do with the, um, the number, since that's what we're talking about. Do we have to actually land on a single number? I know in the past we've given the voters choices. Uh, have we, are we considering potentially giving the voters three choices, you know, status quo, 23, 30, you know, something? So that's a policy uh, question for the council. Um, status quo is basically don't change the size of the council. So the status quo is built into the question, yes or no. The answer is no if you want status quo. Yes would be well, one but, but or is, the other is, numbers, right? Is the question, I don't want, someone may very well want to see a redistricting independent commission and all of those things. So if it's all built into one question, it's not really a fair. So, so that's the different question of is independent redistricting tied on the ballot with the number of the size of the council, right? right? So if you, have, if you separate those, independent redistricting is a question for the voters and then the structure of the council districts is a different question and then what do you present one number do you present multiple numbers right and i don't think we've landed as a policy discussion my, my gut reaction is they should be separate votes <clears throat> that the, the public is yeah. um does want to see independent redistricting um i would imagine and and that should be a unique vote and not not tied to that number because that number is a very different set of questions right um, but obviously that's up for, for discussion, as is, I guess, the question of whether we have multiple choices in the, you know, in the number on the council. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the last time this was on the ballot, there were multiple choices, and they both died. Yeah. And so I, th I that's The two why previous times, they were given two choices on each time, and they both... And and it, it could well be, I mean, I, I mean, to your point, Mr. Bloomfield, first on whether they're tied or not, I agree with you completely because come hell or high water, we are going to pass independent redistricting as far as I'm concerned. Um, and if council expansion doesn't come with that, you know, I will be disappointed. But I would be much more disappointed if we tied these two things together and because of one of them, independent redistricting didn't pass. That would be a terrible result. So um, I, I, you know, this question of whether they're tied or not may come down to you know, some degree of determining what the public is willing to do and prefer and maybe some polling and so on, but um, it, just to make sure that if, if they, if they were tied, and they're going to be tied in terms of substance, I inevitably, but, but the passage of the ballot measure, if they were tied together, we had better make sure that they are both going to pass. <laughs> and uh, because I, I just think any scenario by which there's a threat to the passage of independent redistricting would, be, would not be acceptable to me. So that, that's... That's my thought. And it, you know, as we're having this discussion, since there are these other questions that I think are part of the rack up that we're asking you now, uh, Mr. Wickham, it could be that it was, a, it was a misstep to start off with the number. Maybe we should come back to that. <laughs> um, I, I, I do, I, again, I, I feel you know, a moderate level of comfort with, with 23. Um, but I could be convinced that it could be 21 or 25 or whatever. I, I, but I think that's the area that I feel comfortable in. But if we can't settle on that now, maybe we can put it on the, in the parking lot and come back to it after we've had further discussion. But Mr. harris Tossin, you wanted to be heard? Yeah, just I'm going to ask you to opine on this, and you can tell me no if you, if you want to. Um, is it your opinion, because I, I have a similar concern to the one the chair just articulated, do you think we give ourselves a better shot at this if we're looking at the entire charter 
as opposed to looking at this question in isolation. The independent redistricting seems easier to look at in isolation because, you know, there are other examples across the country and in the state and even in the county. Um, and so we can kind of see how that goes. Um, I, I, I just asked that question because it's, it's still on my mind today as, you know, one of our co former colleagues is in court right now getting sentenced. We have as many problems getting rid of council members as we do, frankly, more problems getting rid of people <laughs> as we do adding. And that's something that also comes up in the charter. So I just, you know, it, that's one of the things that gives me pause, right? So how do we think about this? This To think about the size of the council in isolation of the entire charter seems difficult. Uh, and I'm just wondering what you're, having looked at it and, and been immersed in the issue uh, for several months now, I just wonder if you had an opinion on that. It, the independent redistricting question is in some ways very technical. There are lots of levers to push and pull along the way. And I think you can draft that and, and structure that and put that forward in a way that um, will or won't make sense. Um, I think, and it's, the, the size of the council I, I think is a big, it's a big question in how you do it and what makes sense for the city and what makes sense for the voters and what makes sense for the residents. Because again, I think is, um, somebody pointed out, it's not just the voters, it's the residents. There are four million, there are four million residents in the city. Um, coming to that solution um, has other, other decision elements and decision points that are not just technical, right? And I don't, I don't know quite how to measure that. And you may never be able to measure that. It's only what happens once you get to that point and somebody's going to um, make a choice on a ballot. I think the, 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 the option that, again, you're facing of whether to tie them on a ballot or have them separate is going to be determined based on that. But I, I really don't know. Um, I think there's, there's probably a lot more that you would want to consider in that conversation. You don't have to make a decision on this point until it's time to go to the ballot. And it, 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 as I understand the calendar, just to remind you, if you were going to the March ballot, you would have to decide by November. And I don't see that we're going to be able to process all of this in order to go to the March ballot. So that means the, the November ballot, based on the time in front of us, and you have a few more months after that it, to have that conversation. So if you need to take that time, and I think Mr. Krikorian pointed out that the outside groups are doing some, some additional work on this, you may want to take advantage of that effort. Yeah, and, and if I can just add to that, um, I, I think there seems to be universality about the idea that uh, this proposal should be on the November ballot, which allows plenty of yeah. uh, lead time for us to make revisions for further public input for, you know, frankly, polling and other things that some of the outside groups are already engaged in doing. All of those things, uh, it, this gives us plenty of time to do that by November. On your other point, though, about other related charter reforms that may be connected to this, um, it is, we already have motions in place that will be taken up by this committee on some of those very things you mentioned, like what are the remedies available when a member is censured? You know, what are, what's the removal process when there's, all of those things that we've struggled with that the current charter is clearly inadequate to address, those will be before this committee and will be ripe to be able to put on the November ballot as well. We have the time to do that. But to the extent that they're related, if we don't start moving forward with some specificity, particular proposals around this, we won't be able to get to some of those other related discussions. Um, you, you see what I mean? I'm yeah, just, I'm just I, I want us to, to sort of channel things down through the funnel so that we have some clarity on what we're doing in this category of things before we move on to that category of things. Gotcha. And uh, because otherwise, if they're all interrelated, we'll never get to any decision on anything, which would be the worst possible result. So we will be taking up those other 
issues. Councilman Baraman has a number of motions. You know, we, we, I think a number of us have a number of motions that will be taken up on all sorts of things, dealing with this, even this executive legislative thing and land use reform and authority by the council and many other things that we will still have time to get on the ballot in, in November as well. Councilmember Hernandez, did you want to be heard? Yes, no, I just wanted to em emphasize, I think, what Councilmember Marquis Harris Dawson brought up. But in addition to that, it's also the amount of times that we meet per week. That is part of the charter, um, if, not, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And it would be great. I know one of the things that our constituents want is more access to us, to be, for us to be able to be more out there. And so I just think that's one of the things that we should also consider is if we could change the amount of times that we have to meet per week. The Board of Supervisors meets once a week and they get it done. Maybe we could go to a smaller number because I would really love to be able to engage our districts more. And, you know, and that is a related issue because maybe if you have a different number of council members, I, I don't know which way it cuts because we haven't really discussed that, but it, it could be that it's easier to do that or it could be that it's harder. I don't, I don't know, but you're right. That's one of the things that we should also be assessing as long as we're looking at opening up um, charter changes around governance. Councilmember Ahmed, welcome. Sorry, I was late. No, not at all. <laughs> Had some transit issues. Um, okay. I was listening to the discussion on the way here, and I know that we're planning to move on to some less thorny questions uh, other than council size, but I did want to say that, you know, when I've been thinking about this issue, um, I think an increase in previous meetings, for example, people have mentioned a number like 19. Um, you were talking about 23 earlier today, and I would just, I, I think I would, I would be arguing for the largest number that we could do while still maintaining the functionality of this body. Um, and that's, that would be my very strong position uh, on this. I think there are, uh, Councilmember Park, you asked some excellent questions about uh, office functioning, office staff size, um, office budget that I think we may need to get answered before we determine that number. Uh, because I think if we don't have those numbers in front of us, we will not know how effective these larger numbers of offices will be. But I do wanna make a case for us to be thinking about the largest number that will get us to the most effective office that we can imagine. So just wanted to say that. I know we've moved on, but thank you. Okay. Um. We haven't yet, so thank okay. you. That's okay, that, that's helpful. I, I, I was just <laughs> I, I was just <laughs> suggesting that we might want to, to yeah. do that unless any members want to try to land this plane on this issue right now. Um, just to your point, uh, at 23 members of the council, each of our districts would still be larger than every city in Los Angeles County other than Los Angeles, Glendale, and Long Beach. We'd be comparable to the, each district would be comparable to the size of Santa Clarita, um, just by way of context for how, what 23 seats would, would mean. 175,000 approximately uh, people uh, in the district. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Bloomfield. I mean, was, I was intrigued by the analysis one of the groups came forward about representation. I mean, for me, this, the increase is all about increasing representation. Yeah. And, you know, they were saying that a certain number hits that spot and then a certain number above that uh, actually diminishes the representation. And, but they were looking at it specifically for Asian Americans. Um, but I, I don't know, have we had comparable analysis for the African American community and for other communities to see where the sweet spot is and then where the overlap is where we get the most representation um, without the dilution? We have not been uh, charged with doing that kind of an analysis. We could, um, I, I, I'd have to take that back and, and see what we would be able to do or what would be appropriate to do. Yeah. Um, but I can, we can have that, like that That's important to me. I would love that analysis. Yeah. The kind of analysis that Councilman Park was talking about is important just from a practical perspective. What is, what is it going to mean to right. to running this place and, and, and in terms of the, what the budget would mean is if it's going to be such a budget buster, we know that also is a political yeah. issue. So having some of those numbers will help us 
land because I, I think a lot of us share Ms. Raman's uh, desire to see, you know, to, to maximize, but to do it in a way that that is smart for our city, yeah. um, both in terms of representation, in terms of cost, and in, and in terms of functionality, and and in terms of looking at the other piece, which we which we've talked about the the, the power bread dynamic, because I'd recognize as we increase we increase the power of the council president. When we increase the numbers, we increase the power of the mayor, and we increase the power of special interest. That's a concern. But on the flip side, and very heavily, is the representation. So, yeah. so I, I, um, as I had said earlier, once we get closer to an, an understanding of the range of the numbers, we'll be able to do some of the budget analysis, and, and some of those issues will be um, easier to do. Um, I'm always, like I've said before, I'm always mindful and careful about doing any uh, analysis uh, based on race because that is not a primary factor that we're able to use. In, in we just want to be careful that we're not stepping into um, a, a bad um, direction. Well, in maybe we just put it out. We don't <laughs> want to be in violation of the Voting Rights Act, right? right. So I just want to be careful and mindful of that. I, I appreciate it. I want to just put it out in the ether since we already had one group come forward with some interesting analysis to there are a lot of folks who have a lot of interest to encourage people to come forward with that kind of analysis because it is it is helpful even though it can't be dispositive. And I got you. It's, and, but it's, it's difficult for it's you to do. It's perfectly appropriate for them to do that. We should be more careful. Yeah, that's, that's why I framed it that way. <laughs> so, um, and I you. actually me the, the comment about maintaining functionality um, actually has prompted me to throw a question back to you, Mr. Krikorian, Mr. Blumenfield, because um, you were both in Sacramento and the legislatures there, which have large numbers of representatives, um, 40 and 80, right? Um, so from the functionality of the count, now you've had time in the functionality of the council of a small body. When we go to a much larger body, at some point, the type of conversation, the, the type of debate, I think the point you raised about the role of the, the council president as being the leader of the body and maintaining the discussion in the body changes. At some point, that functionality shifts, and I wouldn't know how to measure that. You've had experience in both. Um, this is weird for me to ask you a question. Well, I, Mr. Bloomingfield just hit on it uh, in, in one respect. When you have a larger body, the leadership of that body is significantly more empowered in setting agendas and, you know, determining committee assignments and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, it's important here, but when you have a body of 80, it's decisive The the speaker decides what happens in in the state assembly and it's not it's a, it, an extraordinarily rare circumstance that the speaker's will is um, steamrolled by the body in, in Sacramento that just doesn't realistically happen here you know I mean frankly it happens all the time <laughs> well I shouldn't say it happens all the time but you know that the, the, the my proposal might pass, might not pass. And, and, and so some, somewhere in between those things is, um, you know, I, I don't think we want to be, my view is I don't think we would want to go so much to the you know, House of Representatives model or the, uh, or the state assembly model where that's the case, where the power all resides in council leadership. Um, but at the same time, to Councilmember Rahman's point, if you don't, you know, have some significant increase in the numbers, you're not going to move the needle at all when it comes to actual participatory democracy. So that's, right. you know, where, where the where the fulcrum is in that balance. I, you know, it's, that's why this is a hard discussion. Mr. Boom, just yeah, be careful what you wish for because as you, it seems like you're getting more power to the people as you expand and but if you make it too many and too much then then uh, even if the 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 folks in a very small area are able to have an inordinate influence on, over that member that member has much less control over over the process and over the the comings and goings of that district just like in the legislature you really don't have any control over your own district um, granted it's different kinds of things you're not dealing with specific land use stuff but um, 
you have more bigger policy uh, things and you have to build coalitions and it's, it's a very different environment than it is here whereas individual members you have uh, a much much more direct ability to to uh, make change for your constituents within the district you don't the, as you get bigger that that becomes right. diluted when you are having debate on issues here in the council you have the opportunity for 15 people to speak and speak again and speak again and i don't believe in sacramento that the there's that it, the debates were able i mean considering all of the items that you have on your agenda and the number of issues that you and you're doing in a multiple state it seems like that level of debate is going to be different well, depending well, on the it, size of the membership and you well in sacramento you don't have public comment either and you that takes up a lot of the time uh, certainly in council that you right. don't have in in the legislature very they're they're not subject to the brown act right um, yeah, so it, it's entirely, yes, there are significant limitations on debate, very significant limitations. It's not like here where everybody pushes their button, they get to speak. That, that does not happen in Sacramento. But the flip side of that is they're not subject to the Brown Act. So they can have debates outside of the view of the public. They can have debates in the party caucuses. They can have debates, you know, over dinner. Um, and we can't do that. Yeah. So it's it's <laughs> apples and oranges in a lot of ways. Yeah. Must be nice. Um, I I I know it was difficult to start with a thorny issue, but actually this is really important. Okay. Well, I don't feel like we've advanced the ball too much. Um, again, I'm going to you know plant my flag for purposes of further discussion at 23. But I'm going to suggest I'm fixed. So we're fixed. we're planning a, for yes. a fixed number, and right now the range is around twenty. I'm not asking anybody to to vote on that at this point. I'm just saying that's that's what I would suggest. I think we should come back to this issue after we've yes. come uh, and done some of the easier stuff here. Okay. <laughs> so can we move on to to B, please? I, let's move through all of the. We can move past all of the A's. Yeah. Right. Um, we can move past B, which I think is going to require CLA, city attorney, and maybe some of the other groups discussing how to refine the language in this context of what does commission, what is yeah. the commission purpose? And, and as you do that, I would recommend that you consider that there's a difference between what goes in the charter and what goes into the ad code or whatever other supplemental, you know, th there's a very long discussion of the, um, of the purpose of the redistricting commission and so on that was provided by Common Cause. There was a very succinct one that was submitted by our LA. I think the charter should be fairly clear and succinct, but it could be spelled out much more in the ad code. Yes. And um, just to um, finalize this, it really is saying we're talking about independent redistricting. That will be the key point here, and that this is a process where um, the the commissioners are being selected through a process that's independent of um, any involvement from the elected officials. Okay. okay. Moving on to C. Right. Um, C, one, the number of commissioners we placed at 17 in our recommendation. We had um, the ad hoc com committee had given us some math to do. You didn't want, um, it was something like more than nine, less than 21, not 15, because that's the number of council members we currently have. And so that left you with 13, 17, or 19. 13 people find to be bad luck. So um, that kind of puts you at 17 and 19. Um, the Los Angeles government reform group came in at 17. Our LA liked the idea of a larger commission. And Common Cause came in at 14. 14 is what we have for the county commissions. So it sounded like 17 was the middle range of what was on the table. Any strong feelings, members, whether that number should be adjusted? 17, are we comfortable with 17 plus alternates? OK. And we, were, we put it at four alternates, which has been standard across the other jurisdictions. Um, Jenny, just to be clear, on the alternates participate in the conversation. Yes. It's not, it's not like a, a jury. Um, these alternates are there, able to speak. The only issue that comes up is a vote at the end. Of the exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, that would be helpful for them to be in the conversations, monitoring and following what is going on at the work. That would be important. So there's going to be a discussion uh, shortly about the duration of their service um, and whether or not they should serve for 10 years until the next round or something, some abbreviated term. If it is going to be for a longer term, I would just suggest that maybe the number of alternates needs to be a bit higher um, or there needs to be a process to select new people if in the ensuing six or seven years people moved out of town or you know whatever um, we need to be able to backfill those numbers in some way either with alternates or by a new selection process yes we've heard county of los angeles has had one or two commissioners um, uh, resign uh, the, the la county sits for 10 years so um, okay. that we know that there are real world um, implications for that okay so okay. yes councilmember hutt so Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Hey, John. Uh, I have a question on the, um, al the alternates. So let's say we pick a number of commissioners and then two people, you know, resign for whatever reason. We move two people that are alternates into that space. Yes. Do we backfill our alternates with two more alternates? Um, if you wanted to do that, you could do that. Um, we hadn't considered that as an option, um, but you could do that. And there are ways that you could do that. You could go back to the pool of applicants that had already been um, submitted and considered previously. You could open up a new application pool. There are a variety of ways that you could address that. So I'm just curious yeah. because I, I'm interested in knowing how we stay whole. Um, if we could take that back and consider that and we'll come back to you with some thoughts. Thank you. And that just reminded me too, on the, on the alternates, we had talked about making sure that geography was uh, a factor so that if we, we lose alternates, we lose someone from one geography that we make sure that there's always, there's always some representation of the different geographies, however we define them. Um, we're obviously not defining them by district, but even just by regions or something. Yeah. Um, let me give that a little bit more thought. It might be that when you do the selection, when you set on the geography for selection of commissioners, right. it would be one alternate from each geography. But when you're backfilling a, a, a spot, you may be backfilling a geography spot, you may not. And so um, all of the models that we've seen had a basically a random selection process out of the alternate pool. Uh, because at, the, at that point you're, uh, you know, at some point you, you want the commission to commission, if that makes any sense. I've, I turned the word into a verb. No, I'm you, sorry. you want them to do their work. I, I guess we all, you know, a big part of this is understanding the area that you're, yeah. you know, we know that most commissioners, 99% 90, of the commissioners are not going to know the difference between Woodland Hills and West Hills. Yeah. I want to have somebody there whether they're the alternate or whoever who understands the difference yeah. between those two communities. And, and the same for everyone else in every other district. Um, you want, you, somehow, wh whatever the mechanism is to make sure that there is some uh, balance, and not, it doesn't have to be pure balance, but, but some note of the geography. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay. Let me, we'll, we'll take that pack as part of our. Okay. Um, and I think it's a good point, Mr. Blumenfield, that it, it, numerical you know, equity is not the critical issue here uh, because that will be very hard to ever get and to define in any way that makes any sense. And you'd have to have regions that were you know, equal in population. It, it just raises a level of complexity that I don't know is necessary. But having representation does matter. Like in the county's process, the, the San Fernando Valley, I, I think, had one person uh, at the end of the day for you know, two million, uh, an area of two million population. And it was clear that many of the decisions were made were made without an understanding of the, even the geography of the valley, let alone the communities that live there. So, um, so having, that, having voices there who can speak to those regional things, I think yeah. is going to be critical. I don't know that we need to ensure that it's, you know, we're dividing it up into 
quadrants or something yeah. to that level of complexity. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Mr. Wickman, is, what is a desired candidate for a role like this? And are there any protections or policies to make sure that we have people from all walks of life on this committee? We're coming up to that in a little okay, bit. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for looking ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, C2D, alternate commission shall be able to participate. Mr. Blumenfield, that was your point. Um, term of the commission. So the options are for the, this is uh, C3. The options are for the, uh, the time it's required for them to do their work, which would be roughly three years or 10 year period. And at the end of the 10 year period, the commission would then um, initiate the process to replace themselves. So members, I'll, I was I was one of those voices that thought that 10 years sounded crazy because I couldn't imagine people being willing to commit 10 years to, to doing this and so on. But I've kind of, I, I, I've had a change of thought after hearing some of the comments on this. Um, in the event that there were a lawsuit, say, challenging a set of maps, to me it, it makes sense to have people who are ready to go to draw the new set of maps rather than having to reinitiate this process altogether again. Um, I, I, do, I do have a little bit of concern that it, you're going to have a drop off of interest in participation by people if you tell them up front you're committing to 10 years of, you know, not being able to, you know, of having to submit all of the public disclosure and everything else for 10 years. but most of that work is front loaded in a relatively short amount of time and then they're just pretty much on call the remainder of the time but there may be some who would be concerned about you know the restrictions that we're going to put on on commissioners um, so i just raised that but but i'm leaning more towards you know as the you know all of those uh, who reported to us indicated that 10 years it makes more sense but um Thoughts, Councilmember Harris Dawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kukorian. I I was like you uh, as well, and thought ten years, and and um, thought that would be off-putting. Uh, but having uh, just the anecdotal evidence of interviewing people who've been a part of the State Redistricting Commission, which they actually I actually didn't know until now that they're on call for ten years, yeah. and what they described was after the main part, it was maybe one meeting a year, done on remotely. Um, or sometimes they needed to be signatories on documents for the state to go forward with, with business uh, regarding redistricting. So it, it, once I heard directly from someone who'd been through it, it seemed to make a lot more sense. Yeah. And also they didn't have to donate to my campaign because they were restricted from doing so for 10 so, years. So that was a plus. <laughs> yes, plus. That, from their point of view, yeah. it was a plus. Yeah. <laughs> Council Member Hutt. Thank you. I'm, I'm just always concerned about apathy. You know, 10 years seems like, uh, like who, who do we get that will want to commit themselves to this process this long? So is there a, is there a can we do a five year with a option so that we could do the callbacks for signatures and so on? So I just, I'm just, you know, one thing I'm concerned about, are we getting young people? And then when you're asking young people to sign up for something for 10 years they're like what that so. seems to be exactly that that was the concern that that i had and maybe there's a way that you can nuance this in the way that it's drafted by saying uh, you know that they're maybe it is two-tiered maybe mm -hmm. it's you know the term is whatever two years three years and then it the person you is subject to recall, subject to being recalled to service, subject to being, you know, something like that. It has the same effect, but if there's a way that you could do it so that it doesn't sound so onerous Daunting. to people, because you, you know, I hadn't even really thought about this point of young people, but if you're, if you're 20 years old and you're told that something is going to be for 10 years, that's, you know, you're not, you're, it, it's, Who knows where you're going to end up? I mean, if, if you feel like you're just on standby, that's one thing. But if you know, part of this is you're you're DQ'd from 
a lot of the political participation over the course of those 10 years. That's the, that would be what may keep some people out of it. But, but of course, we have things, the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners that oversees done. They've served multiple mayors 10 plus years. We have a lot of commissioners that have been around for, for longer than that. Um, so that doesn't scare me as much. It just, it's, um, you know, what it, maybe, maybe some of the requirements can come down after, after the first couple of years in terms of what they can and can't do. You know, in terms of the, you really want them out of the political process during the first couple of years when they're drawing the lines, but when they're on call for the next eight years, does it really matter so much? I, I don't know. And then, and then the other question is, are they still subject to all the same requirements if they move out of town? Are they still a commissioner? Um, you know, why not? I, I, I don't see a reason why they shouldn't be, but we'd have to resolve those kinds of things as well. That was my question. Commissioners are, are residents of the city. So if they did move out of town, they would no longer be a commissioner. And, and so if you have a tenure period, let's say somebody does decide in year six that they want to run for office or they want to get politically engaged in, in some way, then those people would become ineligible and they would drop off the list and they'd have to be replaced. Um, so, you know, it, it, there wouldn't be... I, there's, I, a, there's a five-year window against it, right? Isn't there... It, you don't get to just... You can't quit and then run for office or, or donate to a campaign. You can't. You got to quit and then wait five years before you can do those things. Right? Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the factors you'll have to consider is um, what number of years would you be disqualified? Um, there are some jurisdictions where you're not you're not allowed to run for a district that you help draw, right? Um, or do you want it? Some of it's just like okay, by the sixth or eighth year, it's not relevant anymore. So that's something that you'll want to consider. And, and you know, look, we're, I mean, we're picking six, 17 people out of 4 million residents. Um, you know, yeah. yes, there will be some people who will think, well, maybe someday in the future I might want to run for office, so I'm not interested in this. But there's 4 million people who live here. I'm sure we could find, you know, people who, for whom that does not, uh, is not a concern. Uh, yeah. and, and that should really be the goal. I mean, the goal should be to have independent commissioners who maybe aren't really looking forward in, uh, to their political careers. So Council Member Hutt and then Council Member Park. It, uh, thank you. Um, John, is that a part of the charter now? That people who have served before? No. And drew the lines that can't? Yeah. No, it's not a part. Of it. It's not. There is no restriction on running for office in the from the for or serving in office. We had members of the Independent Redistricting Commission who were currently serving in public office, and former office holders and lobbyists and you candidates know, people for who office. were running for office or planning to run for office. So this is one of the things that's most, in my view, most critically needed. Family members yep. running for office. Is that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm I, sorry I didn't hear the question. Uh, uh, Councilmember Robbins' question was whether there would be any restriction on family members running for office, and then uh, I want to recognize Councilmember Park after. Um, the so our recommendation when we um, when we get to that is that the is to follow state law, which does have a. Um, Restriction for the commissioner and their spouse would be the same number of years, which is in state law eight years, and then um, other family members come in at four years. So there are it, it's extend it's extended beyond the individual under state law, and we would recommend following that for the ability to enforce and consistency. Councilmember Park. So if we put these requirements around length of term and qualifications to serve on the commission, restrictions on political participation. If we put that into the charter, and at some point down the road, some or all of that doesn't work out the way we expected, or there are some issues that we haven't anticipated, and we wanted to make a change, now we're back at charter reform. 
So I'm wondering, it's, would it make sense for some or all of that to go in the admin code instead? Is that possible or does this have to be as part of the charter language? Um, so you actually have three options. Um, the one I mentioned was that you follow state law. So if you want to change state law, in that case, you could go to the legislature and have them change it. That would be, in some ways, I don't know if it's easier, but it's, it's, it's different than going to the voters because you go to the legislature and it's a law, and if you can convince enough of them to would vote for it, then the legislature can change it. If you put it in the charter, then you do have to go to the voters. If you put it in the admin code, then you can do that. But there are questions about how easy is it to change the admin code, and then are you starting Cutting to change it in a way that's easy? Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's the balance of where do you want the, the, diff, the, the level of difficulty and the level of independence from the city council. If you, put, if you go with state law, it's, it is entirely independent of the city council and the mayor. So coming back to Councilmember Harris Dawson's point about the state commission and annual meetings and stuff, what do they do at those meetings? Because once the district's drawn, I mean, and, and I'm not asking this facetiously, no. what I mean to say is after the maps are drawn and finalized and in place, um, I, the only role that I can think of that a commissioner would have for continuing service would be in the event that those maps are invalidated by a court. If they are, then it's, you're starting from scratch. If they're not, there's literally nothing for them to do. Is there? Am I missing something? I mean, what else would they do? Uh, I, I actually don't know. I'll, I'll, we'll have to check in with the state and see what they're doing. When we spoke to the county, they hadn't met yet on the interim. I so, mean, I suppose you could be doing some preparatory work for the next decennial census or something, but, but there's... Yeah. Uh, it, it's, but, so, which, which brings me, and, and I'd like to know the answer to that, but which brings me to the language that you actually put as the suggested term, I think addresses the points that some of us have raised and that Councilmember Hutt particularly was, was pointing out. If the term... The term is until the end of uh, the adoption of the final redistricting plan and if recalled by a court to address any litigation. That way, it doesn't sound like it's the full 10 years, but it would be if a court should step in and make any invalidation of, of the maps. And then if whenever that happens, if it happens five years down the road and it turns out three people have moved out of town or they decided to run for office or something, they would be eliminated. They would no longer be eligible. They would be replaced by the alternates or our process for replacement of alternates. Exactly. Okay. To me, that makes, I, th I think that makes sense in, in having them be on call, but not having to bite off the, you know, what sounds like an onerous responsibility of serving for 10 years on somebody that, you know, you don't know what you're going to be doing for those 10 years. Okay. Does that, does, I mean, are, are we all comfortable with the language then that in C3? Or, okay. Okay. Generally, it seems like it's subject to further reporting that you're going to do on some of those issues. Okay. Great. Next. Um, we would have the process start in a year ending in nine. Um, so that gives, you're not waiting, you're not starting the year of the census, you're starting the year before. That allows the this application process to unfold, whatever that administrative process is. They would be seated, and then they could start education. They could start um, outreach programs on census if there's still relevant time to do that work. They could do their training, because um, we know the census occurs on April 1st of a year ending in zero. The census data is released a, by April 1st of a year ending on one. So this basically creates a year from, from April 1, of a nine to April one of a zero, 
for the application process to unfold and then April 1 of a zero to April 1 of a one for training, for initiating, you know, hiring staff, um, doing initial outreach, doing all of their organizational work and then beginning the work on um, hearings related to um, communities of interest, et cetera, so that by April, April 1 of a year ending in one, the census data comes out and they're able to, to start drawing maps. When does the census, it, so last year it was, or last round, it was screwed up by COVID. So, yeah. but for that, when would census data typically be finalized April, and delivered to the city? Um, theoretically by April 1 of a year ending in one. So 2031, 2041, 2051. Okay, okay. so if we start the process in April of the year ending in nine, it gives a full year to seat the commission, and then the commission has a, another full year to start its work even before census data is available. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> And especially, in, especially in light of recommendations from the pre advisory redistricting commission, which thought it would be important for the commission to start earlier, um, give grants to community-based organizations to start okay. building, right? So you need time to do contracts and find those organizations, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's imperative. We ha in the last round, we had so fairly sophisticated organizations representing communities of interest in this city who were coming in essentially at the last minute um, because they didn't feel that they had you know I, I guess they didn't feel like they had had sufficient outreach or whatever so they were coming in like we have to make sure that this is as that there's as much ramp up time as is possible before the census data even becomes available to, to let people know this is underway Okay. Those time frames make sense to me. Anybody have any thoughts about them? Okay. Doesn't seem so. Okay. Great. Next, um, who is managing the com the commission selection process? Um, we there was a lot of conversation. I had a sense from the committee that this the city clerk was the preferred choice. Um, there was general thoughts on city clerk, ethics commission, personnel department, somebody else that was unnamed and, and never named. So um, one option would be to just pick one. Another option would be to pick one with an appeal to another of those. So that would give you some kind of a process that's independent, again, of the elected officials. Um, that would be a staff process. Um, so our recommendation is the city clerk, but if you would like to do something different, again, our suggested And terms, can you yeah. more specifically define what aspects of the application process are, are we talking about? So it's um, preparation of the application itself, um, doing the outreach, um, and letting people know broadly in the city that the applications are available, where to submit the applications. Um, this uh, body would then evaluate the applications to help identify the pool of candidates and then um, they would conduct the random selection process of the pool. Um, the pool would actually also um, be publicly noticed, the names of the, and the applications of the uh, people would be publicly noticed so that if there is any public, um, it gives the public an opportunity to review the names and determine whether there um, are concerns that should be raised for consideration as well. And then um, again, the, this body would, or this entity would um, conduct the first step of the selection process. Okay, so we had this whole discussion about objective and subjective uh, uh, roles in the selection process. Everything you just described is entirely objective. Um, it is, that is, will be part of the process. Um, what, how, if you want objective and subjective, or if you only want objective, we still, you all, you all didn't give much direction on that, so yeah. we're coming up to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so the question is, should the clerk do it? Should the ethics commission do it? Should somebody else do it? Or a combination? Councilmember Robin. No, 
here that Common Cause recommends that the Ethics Commission do it, um, but you have a different recommendation, and it's one of the places where you've you haven't deferred from some of the recommending groups frequently, so I just wondered whether you could speak to that difference. What was the logic behind putting it at the city clerk? Um, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke just a moment ago. None of these are recommendations, they're only suggested terms um, because we know that you were going to have this conversation. No, no. And so, and even just the suggestion, placing the suggestion. Yeah, yeah, the reason we hit on that suggestion is it was um, expressed as a preference during the hearings that we. That, um, that were held, that the city clerk be designated. So we had heard um, in those conversations a preference for the city clerk. And so that's, that's why we went with the sense of the hearings that we had. Um, Common Cause was the only organization that had a specific recommendation for it being the Ethics Commission. Um, there was a public comment that suggested the city clerk with the Ethics Commission as a reviewing or, or oversight body so that if there was a question about what was happening on one side, you could, you could take a challenge to another side. And that actually um, has some nice balance in it to, so that if there's a question or concern, somebody else will review that that is outside of the elected body. Was there issues related to capacity that led you to make this recommendation? Or was it really rec suggestion? Uh, was or, it really just you heard set. and expressed? Because I didn't, I may have missed that meeting, but I didn't necessarily hear that there was an express preference on this, um, on this committee for where the, um, where the commissioner application process should reside and wondered whether there were any other factors related to, as I said, capacity, no, whether it's no matter which office or department is given this, there will be capacity issues. They will need staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I've spoken about the clerk and the ethics commission. They both said we would need staff. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Mr. Blumenfield, then Mr. Harris Dawson, then Ms. Hernandez. Could I just, uh, just oh, yeah. one, I'm sorry. one you were done. if I could just, yeah. one last note would just be to me some oversight by the Ethics Commission feels like it would be essential to this commission having trust from the public. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage us to think about either utilizing the Ethics Commission more or utilizing it um, in, in the partial way oversight um, method that you recommended. Mm -hmm. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, I know I, I see that point and, and certainly um, we want to engender trust. It, it is depending on the dynamic of the time, you know, the Ethics Commission is, is made up of political appointees by the mayor, uh, whereas the, the clerk's office is obviously an appointed position by the mayor, more direct control, but often is one that's seen as a little bit, with a little bit uh, hands off, more of an administrator. I, for me, it's about capacity and making sure that, that, that these things actually get done, and you, we know the clerk's office does these kinds of things, but I, I like the idea of having ethics involved. Um, you know, so maybe there is some sort of hybrid where you, you, you can lean on the administration and the capacity of the clerk's office, because the ethics commission doesn't really have a lot of capacity. But we would add staff and that kind of thing, but where I come down is, is some sort of a hybrid where you have the, the bureaucracy there to make sure that it happens, but then you have the ethics appointees there presumably to, to have a little bit more distance from, from the mayor, although query whether they actually do. Mr. Harris -Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. So, so I have a question about um, what your thoughts are about employing some prepackaged outside help with this. Um, and, and I obviously you can't turn it over to a law firm or an accounting firm or something like that, but perhaps uh, engaging them in the process, engaging such a body in the process might help one with some level of independence. It wouldn't be complete independence, but uh, as well as the administrative load. I, I'm very concerned about the idea of the Ethics Commission doing it, frankly, because one could make the critique that the Ethics Commission can't keep up with the ethics of the city. So to add another task of this significance um, seems to make that problem even worse. Okay. 
council member in accounting a, firm law firm outside help that was the question so oh, i'm sorry I, 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 <laughs> yeah okay. a consultant of some sort and yeah. we would have to be we would have to figure out how to define what that consultant service mm. is thank you <clears throat> thank you council president um Similar to what Council Member Rahman has uplifted, I think it needs to be a combination of both. And if the problem is that they don't got enough money in staff, then it's a great opportunity to figure out how we get them um, money that is not attached to the budget process so that there is more, um, how do I say, less conflict of interest in that. So I, I think it would be good to have both because the city clerk does a great job of managing things, of doing outreach, of doing education to our communities. But I think um, the committee does want to see more accountability and transparency and having the ethics department be a part of it. And perhaps with some other kind of money that's not attached to our budget process, I think would be helpful. Okay. I, I agree. And I think if, certainly if there's going to be any kind of subjective analysis of these applications. I mean, the clerk is, is terrific at the ministerial administrative function of running elections and so on, the mechanical stuff. It's exactly in the clerk's office skill set, but if there's going to be any subjectivity to this, um, I think it's got to be the ethics commission that that exercises that subjectivity, um, and likewise the two a two tiered system so that there is ethics commission oversight over what the clerk does. I think is a is a good belt yeah. belt and suspenders kind of uh, approach. And the, the other part other? of that is um, if the names of the pool are published. And the public has an opportunity to express a challenge Thank you. Thank you. to a name based on a factor of some sort, yes. then the oversight body would be in position to evaluate that that challenge. Yeah, right. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't think it would be fair to just you know randomly say yes or no. I think somebody should actually look at it. Right. And that that would have to be the ethics commission, in my view. Yeah. Councilmember Hutt. Have we? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Have we ever uh, employed a clearinghouse for applications of any sort? Uh, what do you mean? Like you know, like an outside, sauces? yeah, like a a outside, firm yeah, something? accounting firm. Mm -hmm. Have we ever employed them for anything of this sort I, to to well, clear applications and go through processes, do the vetting, so that it is you know separated from the city one hundred percent. Maybe the personnel department has done something like this. I could, we could check and see if there's somebody would be able to do this kind of search committees, like executive search committee. Yeah, uh, so there may be some firms that do that kind of that level of work. I'm just curious to see how what precedence yeah. is and how to yeah. really I, separate uh, who our commission is from anything. That right. So if you want to come over to the other side, you can sit on the Olympics. Uh huh. We employed um, uh, auditing firms for the Olympics, so you know it's not uncommon for us to go out to contract for various services. Um, if you were to make a decision on having uh, a particular office do it, there isn't anything preventing that office from contracting out. At least I don't think so. Right. Thank you. And, and that, that was actually my next point: is even if you did have contracting, somebody would need to manage the contract. Yeah. So you would need to name somebody inside the city no matter what. Yeah. Okay. All right. We good with that? Okay. Next. Um, so I, I imagine that you agree that there should be an outreach and education program associated with the application process. Indeed. And there should be training. Yes. I think that's okay. not controversial. Um, okay, so the, time, the commission process, selection process would be done in a year and commission receive training. Um, so commissioner qualifications, responsibilities, and restrictions. Uh, we had listed a wide range of qualifications in our report. The Los Angeles Governance Reform Project had identified several um, qualifications. Common Cause had several qualifications, as did our LA. And the only one that I had some sense of from the conversation that was a general agreement was that um, the candidates must be a resident of the city. And I didn't know where to go from there. So I, I would appreciate some direction. 
Okay. Thoughts? Members? It, uh, m my general view is uh, the less subjectivity, the better. I mean, you know, writing essays, you know, that have to be graded by somebody should not be a factor in this. Um, it sh we should have pretty clear minimum standards and then, you know, a randomness of, of the selection process after that. I, I did like um, the idea of having minimum standards, but then also giving the commissioners the opportunity to use other standards that would create more balance within the commission. I think we had a, a two-tiered, some of them had a two-tiered process where the initial selection is made randomly and then those commissioners select uh, the rest of the commission to fill it out and to make sure you have you know, some degree of diversity of representation and all those other factors. Um, I, members, I, Mr. Wickham looks for guidance. Uh, certainly a resident of the city, certainly over 18. Would we at least agree with that, over 18? 18 is pretty young. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Yes. And on the um, residency requirement, looks like the government reform project and RLA both recommended three years of consecutive uh, residency, and Common Cause had a four year threshold. So I think that's another component. Uh, for discussion on the residency requirement. Yeah. Uh, let's see, so Common Cause said four years, government reform said three years. <clears throat> RLA. RLA said three years. So, I mean, somebody who just moved here, probably some degree of familiarity that comes with having been here for a while makes sense. So, so we sh shall we say three years? Yes. Okay. So a resident of the city for three years. Yeah. One of the, in some of the conversations I've had with other organizations, there, there is some concern that people who apply really be aware of what they're getting into in some way. And having had some role in or experience in community engagement or community involvement, whether that's through their church group or through some other civic organization is helpful um, for them to at least have some experience being in the public um, eye. This is clearly going to be very strongly in the public eye, and as we know, that can be very intense. So um, having, I think that's why you see some of these ideas, some of these recommendations from other groups including right. some kind of recommendation or some kind of acknowledgement that they've got some community involvement. So everybody wanted some of that, something like that. Yeah. I get it. I think we all would want some qualifications like that. I just can't think of a scenario by which you can evaluate those qualifications without putting, without somebody putting their thumb on the scale in a way that detracts from the independence of the commission. Yeah. If somebody could define that in a way that made more objective sense, um, that would be that would be helpful. But I mean, there's not even agreement here on whether or not people should have had a voting history, and there's a, an obvious good reason for that because if you require a voting history, you're excluding a significant part of our population here that is not registered to vote. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I, how, how we get to a point of agreement on what level of community involvement is, whatever that means, um, I don't, I haven't seen a proposal that is objective enough for, for my tastes, but, yeah. you know, the, I'm not set in stone on this either. I mean, if we, others have thoughts on it. All of the applications for the county commission are available online. So you can actually go and see the applications of the candidates in the pool. 
And you see that whatever their review process was, was very open in um, accepting what people presented as community involvement. So you, you did see that people were involved in their church or they were involved in the AYSO or they were involved in other kinds of, um, the, you know, they weren't lawyers who were involved in commissions of evaluating um, policies or laws or, or something like that. So, the, but I, your point is well taken that how do you give the review agency guidance that they should be expansive in their evaluation and appreciation of what that community involvement level is in that I don't know how you provide that guidance. And it could be that maybe it's a check in the box. You know, you have a list of things that are examples of community engagement you have to have at least one, you know, being a board member of a neighborhood council counts as community involvement. Yeah. Uh, you know, being a, I, I don't know what they would be. That would be one obvious one that would be easy for us to, to do. Um, yeah. The concern though, is, it, it, apparently in other jurisdictions where the criteria are, are very, are not restrictive at all, there are a lot of applications that come in. Yeah. There are a lot of applications. And if there is going to be, I mean, maybe this is where you do the two-tier thing, where you select the initial um, cut of arbitrarily selected, randomly selected commissioners, and then those commissioners make subjective decisions based on community engagement, as well as the other factors that they're going to consider. If we could come up with something like that, that would give some measure of uh, minimal community engagement without causing somebody to say, yeah, but that excludes people who do X, Y, or Z, um, th that's, that would be the sweet spot. If we could have something that would suggest some minimal community yeah. engagement that is objectively measured and not subjective. Yeah. That would that would make give me a comfort level. Councilmember Bloomfield. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. We, we, the diversity issue on all these things, whether uh, ethnicity and and geography and renter and owner and all that stuff, we need to bake into the selection process, but but not the sort of the first random process. Um, but there should be some criteria as maybe this comes in the in the uh, in the recruitment process we we put these things in you know I, I joked last time about we should measure the thickness of skin meaning how, you know because these commissioners need to have some thick skin because they may get protested at their house they may get all sorts of uh unpleasantries personally that they're that they would never have expected and so Part of it is making sure the expectations and the under, you know, that that's all understood and there's a little bit of self-selection so that if, uh, if you don't have a thick skin, you, you sort of know up front that that is a, that's an issue and you have a chance to self-select. Mm. Uh, but that can, that, we can bake that into the, the recruitment process somehow. But, but I worry about any, any sort of a, you know, a subjective process. And maybe the self-selection process might work across some of these things. Like, for example, uh, Common Cause says, possess relevant analytical skills, ability to be impartial, and appreciate city diversity as a requirement. Just using that as an example, the application form should require somebody to say, you know, to check that box, yes, I do this. I, I am one of those people with analytical. Uh, similarly, you know, evidence of community engagement in the government uh, reform project one. Yes, I have community engagements. Here's what it is. So it's in the application. It's not evaluated by somebody to determine, yes, that's good enough or not good enough, but it's required that you validate, yes, I have these particular skills, abilities, willingness to be engaged, community engagement history, and so on. And as long as you've done that and you sign it, you're in the random selection pool. 
So, okay. so that way, the, the person who knows, uh, I don't know, this sounds like an interesting way to get involved, but I've never really done anything in my community before, they at least know up front, yeah, no, that's not what we're expecting of you. So, so that, that actually touches on E4A, which um, maybe we bring them together. Uh, I was just going to ask whether the letter of recommendation or other evidence of community engagement was something that might be um, relevant in this or that you would feel comfortable with because I think that either shows you've 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 made an effort to explain what you have shown what you have done in your community or you've made an effort to find somebody in your community who's going to stand up for you and that way it's not just somebody who's going to fill out a form on, a, on the computer and, and send it in and see what happens they're actually thinking about it and stepping in and making an additional effort in the application process Give it some thought. I, you, um, you know, and also there's a, there's a difference between what you ask for right up front at the application process, at, at, the, at the threshold of the application, and what you ask for later. Yeah. So it could be that, you know, if you get 10,000 applicants for this and you do your random selection process, then whoever you've randomly selected, you could ask for some of those things at that point, a letter of recommendation or, or whatever. But I... What, I, what concerns me is I don't okay. want to exclude people from applying at the get-go because they, you know, aren't, because they don't know who they're going to get a letter of rec recommendation from, for okay. example. So then let's go back to the, where I started, which was E4A. Um, because in all of the other models, they, they went through this selection process. They narrowed it down to a pool of 100 or 50 or 35, common cause recommended 35. So what I hear you saying is rather than um, having a limit on the initial pool, that it's whatever the applications are that meet these minimum objective thresholds, then you, if it's 10,000, it's 10,000, you randomly select out of that 10,000 a pool of X number, and then it's that pool of X number that you ask to do a little bit extra work. I, Council Member Robin. Just a question, which is, if you'd still ultimately come back to how are you making decisions about what that, what that extra, you know, the, the fruits of that extra work. Um, the subject, it doesn't get us away from the subjective no. versus objective criteria question. No. It, it still has to be as objective as possible. It still has to be as objective as possible. It, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it, this is a, it's a difficult one for me to understand. Yeah. Yeah, the, I guess the only difference would be that you don't have some, somebody bureaucratically deciding among all of them that before we even consider you, you know, I don't think you, your letter of recommendation is good enough. Your le if somebody forgot to sign it. They, you know, I, I'm suspicious of who this person is. You know, it's your brother-in-law or whatever. You know, some bureaucrat should not be making those decisions, um, especially not thousands of times, because that will skew then the pool of who is on this. But if you do the random selection first, that review process would be much narrower and presumably, as we said before, it would be subject to ethics commission review or you know, however the mechanics of, of that would work, that there would be a second tier of appeal. Mr. Blumenfeld. Yeah, I don't know, I'm thinking of the, the, the jury process where you know, jurors are selected, but then the, the councils each have a couple of strikes and the judge has a couple of strikes where they try to get eliminate the extremes. Um, I don't know if there's anything, I, I don't know how this would work because you want to be objective, well, but there may be something where you, you have some ability to, to kind of remove the extremes or concerns and. But so in a jury process, it was on jury duty last year. The very initial process when you sit in the box is you answer 10 questions and it's about your education level and it's about your job and about a whole range of factors that are in one sense objective 
um, but then lead you to the next step where the attorneys from both the prosecution and the defense or the, what's not the prosecution, the other side, the, um, right, ask you questions based on what they learned from your initial statements. And so that whole voir dire process is actually extensive interview process where they then get down to making that decision of whether they cut you or not. So, because um, I, I, I was on the jury pool process myself until I thought about that experience in Superior Court that was fascinating, actually. Um, but it turned into very subjective. There's a story, it was interesting. I totally wouldn't be allowed on the jury. It's object and it's easier to be subjective there because you have two side, two clear sides. Right. And so you kind of, you know, uh, and a judge in the middle. Right. You have a judge, but but you kind of control for that. So you have both right. sides making subjective strikes um, because they have diametric interests. Right. We don't have that in this situation. Yeah. Um, where we have the diametric interests, unless we, unless we open it up to a wider pool of somehow yeah. folks who had an interest to be able to strike, but that gets really messy. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm just thinking about it out loud. So again, once you've narrowed the pool of applicants, though, you could have something sort of similar to that by saying, you know, whatever our requirements are, demonstrated commitment to community uh, issues, um, willingness to consider all sides of, you know, all of whatever the, the subjective-ish factors that we have on this would be. They have to demonstrate that in some way, the, the narrower pool that's been randomly selected, they have to demonstrate that in some way. The, if it's the clerk, the clerk says, okay, their application has these things. And if the person, if they say no, they don't, then the person would have the ability to go to the ethics commission under our two-step process and say, wait a minute, yes, I do. Um, look at these things. The clerk dinged me for no good reason. Um, that way, you you know, if somebody just can't meet whatever our minimal standards are because they can't even demonstrate any community engagement or, or all, then, you know, they won't be able to check those boxes. And... Yeah. But but that would be the time I would think to do it after the random selection, not not ahead of time. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll have to do a little more discussing on on this. I think on the staff side. Okay. Because the other side of it too is implementation on the staff side. Yeah. Right. If the, if, okay. if we can't figure out how to guide staff and how to structure it then we've got the same problem. Let's, let's try to keep moving. We've got right. a lot to cover here. So. Okay. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we recommend, or we have, I gotta stop saying it. Our suggested term is to follow the state law with regard to the restrictions. The restrictions we've summarized in Tachimene, which is page 33 of the document, um, that compares state law with the reports from LA Governance Reform Project, our LA Common Cause, um, which is basically everybody had eight years for the applicant and their spouse except for our LA, which had some situations where um, they were recommending four years for some of the criteria. Um, otherwise, Common Cause um, um, Governance Reform Project and the CLA report um, were following state law. By the way, elected office, does that, that include a neighborhood council member? Yeah, well, there, oh, is that an elected? That's not really an elected office in the sense of a city elected office, is it? I mean, it's elected, but it's not I, I a city that, that's elected why I asked, office. That's why I asked it's not a city that. officer. It's not a it, city officer. It doesn't that's say that. You define your terms. It doesn't say that. So I think that's a choice we have to make. Or, or is, it a, is it a legal issue? Because it's a state code. It's officer of the city. I don't believe. I, I don't know if is that is that up to our discretion or is that is it's that, up to your discretion. I mean, if you or, want to or, follow or state that, law, then that's it. But if you want to do your own thing, then you would have to. Come well, what it. what would state law say about a neighborhood council member being considered an elected office for the purposes of this disqualification? There, I'll have I'll confirm with the city attorney. My belief is they are not elected officials. They're not elected officials under the charter. 
That's the, the citywide the mayor, city attorney, controller, and the 15 council members as officers of the city. Okay, we'll okay. verify that. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, and I, I think we all agreed, just to confirm, that uh, voted in at least one city election in the last four years is not one that we're willing to move forward. Well, we actually didn't close the loop on that, but um, the, the groups that presented had very different views on that. Some said you had to have a clear voting history. And, um, you know, obviously, if you have that, then you're excluding people who. Um, haven't voted or are not eligible to vote as well. Yeah. So we, we, I don't know that we've come to any closure on that. Okay, great. Yeah, I wouldn't want to disenfranchise anybody in this process. Um, so that's one piece at least I'm not comfortable with. Thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe that's related to the issue that we just talked about. Because maybe if you don't have a voting history, but you do have some sort of record of community involvement, then that you know, that ex what, what we, I think what everybody is after is you don't want to select somebody to this who has demonstrated a life of apathy about government to all of a sudden decide, you know. But, but if it's somebody who's not eligible to vote, but they have demonstrated their community engagement in other ways, then maybe that yeah. should be enough. Yeah, it could yeah. be four out of the five or just of the, you know, various things that we're talking about. You don't have to have all of them, but you have to have yeah. some of them. Yeah. yeah. Permanent residence would be a good example. And yeah, I, I actually somehow understood the sense of the committee was that registered voter was not a qualification on this. So, um, okay. okay. Um, so we'll Sorry, we'll use yeah, we'll hold on hold on hold on. Councilman Rob is not a qualification, or it's not. Um, it's, it not. could be one of the qualifications on a checklist. It's no. not. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so we'll use state law as the guidelines. Um, in addition, a person who served as a city commissioner with a pre within the previous four years would not be eligible to be a commissioner. And then, um, this was just my question of, you know, a person may not only sit on one redistricting commission. Do you want somebody who's only, is on the state commission and on the city commission and on the county commission or on the county commission and the city commission? It, it seems you'd only want them on one commission, period. That makes sense. Okay. Um, sit, uh, city employee, just, a pre, uh, former city employee. Oh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Just, Mr. Just, we should, I, I agree with that recommendation, but we should have a clear articulation for why that's the case as we, when we put this forward because uh, I just you know in, in politics we're accustomed to this idea that experience counts against you and I just want to make sure we don't take that for granted yeah I think there are two ways that that's uh, the most significant is the time commitment required to do a job focused on the city of Los Angeles and the detail of the information that you're considering at the city of Los Angeles may not be relevant when you're considering the boundaries for the county or the state. So you want somebody to be focused on the work that they're doing in front of them and not cross. So is your understanding that we're Eliminating people who are currently active on a commission or so there are people no. who are serving on the county commission now that by the time We do this they won't be right. Are those people also ineligible? No, okay. I, it would Got only it. be yeah, it was like okay. yeah Got it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go that far Okay um, a City employee um, So somebody retires as a city employee there would be some time of that they would um, no longer be they would not be eligible to be a commissioner um, Question on the to, you know city commissioner. Does that mean that you can't serve on both the city commission and on the redistricting commission, or does it mean if you've been a city commissioner that you're disqualified? So, if, specifically, if a city commissioner wants to apply, yeah, uh, but they they are willing and ready to uh, resign from their city commission should they be selected, is that allowed? Um, under this criteria, it says you would need to be um, off of a commission for four years before you're a candidate to be Over a commissioner. Over four years. For four years. There's a four-year period. Okay. And, and again, this is this question of is somebody, is somebody a, a political appointee, a, an appointee of the mayor who was 
applying, they've just resigned their commission spot to be on the commission. So again, creating a little bit of a distance for the independence factor in what you're doing here. Why, why do we have a different standard for commissioners than employees? In, in a sense, a yeah, civil yeah. service employee you know, has a lot less political allegiance than a city commissioner does. Yeah. Um, it was uh, uh, just a pin in the, in the if, you, if, if it's four years, that's great too. Uh, yeah, I would say those should probably be the same. Okay. Eight years. For a retiree, a civil service retiree to be excluded for eight years seems draconian. Okay. Um, during service, commissioner shall not endorse work for a volunteer or make a campaign contribution on elective office of the city. Um, and then commissioners shall be ineligible for a period of five years beginning from the date of their appointment to hold city elective office. Um, some, this is again this point of some proposals like common cause for example is that you're not allowed to run for an office that you've drawn a map for. So it's basically 10 years. So five years, 10 years, some other period of time. Any thoughts on that? So with Ethics Commission, it's five years, right? If you've yeah. served on the Ethics Commission, you can't run for city office for five years after leaving the commission. Yeah. So, uh, but I get that if you're actually drawing, well, uh, uh, but the, on the other hand, no single member draws a district map either. You're one of 17. Um, yeah. There should be some, some blackout period for sure, but 10 years to me sounds high. I get the connection because that, yeah, the map's still in place, but you didn't decide that map yourself if you're one of those people. Um, I don't know. I don't have a terribly strong feeling. Count, wait, oh, Councilmember Raman, then Councilmember Hutt, then Councilmember Bloomfield. Is the five-year or ten-year period coming a after the ten-year term? Be no, it's beginning. It, it the begins from the date of your appointment. So if you're appointed in a year ending in zero, it's you can't. So if you're appointed in year. 2030 to be a commissioner, you can't run for council until after 2035. Okay, I, I would just say that I, the common cause recommendation where you are not running for a district that you helped to draw makes, to me, feels like it makes more sense. But, um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why the five-year recommendation would be would make any more sense, actually. Right. Yeah. Just, just a, uh, that's the same point I was thinking too, which is <laughs> it should be about being running for the map that you drew. Yeah. If for some reason, you know, the maps change, or you know, because it, really it's not ten years; it's eight years. It might be when then when you're running for that next map. Yeah. You know, when you have to start filing for that map. As long as you're filing for a seat that you haven't drawn mm. I don't think we should care Excuse so then me. it isn't necessarily 10 years it's just I don't know I don't know if common cause used to this terminology but yeah. to not run for a map that you drew because let's say they draw a set of maps the maps are invalidated um, by the time the new maps are drawn this particular commissioner is not part of that process yeah they've for whatever reason they've they're not eligible um, they will have had no role in drawing, zero role in drawing the maps that are then yeah. drawn. I mean, we're, we're slicing the onion pretty fine here because these are rare circumstances, I think, but that it, there's, a more, there's a greater logic to it if you say that the person can't run for a map that they've cast a vote on. Great. Oh. Excuse me. Comes from you, isn't it a consensus, right? Because if you draw a map here and you like it, but they don't like it, then you have to move a little, you know, like, isn't it consensus based when you're drawing the map? So aren't you voting on the whole city? So that, that's the point I was, I was saying earlier, but 
at some point, yeah, you, you cast a vote. So maybe <clears throat> that's the triggering factor. If you have voted on this particular set of maps, then right. for the 10 years after your appointment, you're not eligible to run in one of those yeah. districts. Right, and then the, the, uh, every commissioner votes on the, the whole. Right, yeah. So for then it seven. goes back to uh, Councilwoman Raman's question, is it 10 plus five? Is it eight plus two? Like, we, we have to make a decision on what that ban is. So the, the two options would be a fixed 10 years, a fixed five years, or I think as Common Cause said, you can't vote on a map that you've, you can't run in a district if you voted on the map of that district. But you vote on all the maps. Right. Yeah. So in other words, the only way that it would be anything different than 10 years would be if those maps were invalidated and you didn't vote on the, on the next set. So if you're on the commission, at the end of the day, you are voting on the whole map, and it's a citywide map. But you've also been in deliberations through the whole process where you may have said, you know, I think the line should be here, not there. Mm -hmm. I, should, I think the line should be here, not there. And so to that extent, you are having, you are helping guide make decisions about specific, you, you may be successful in you know, convincing the other commissioners to draw the line at that place, or you may not. But it's, it, in a sense, you are helping guide the shape of a district. And if you have in your mind that you wanna run for that district, you have been actively engaged in drawing that particular boundary. So my question is, what's the timing? Yeah, so um, I think the time is, it's, it's the, you, again, you can't, you, you would not be able to vote, you would not be able to be a candidate for a district that you helped draw as a commissioner. So if that's 10 years from, you know, so the map is adopted in, in 2032, you would not be able to draw, run for an office until 2042. If there's a court challenge and there's a new map in 2035 and a different commission draws that map or you've resigned from the commission, no, you're no longer a commissioner, then you would be able to run for a map in 2036. Then would we need to add that language into the application process so that people had an understanding of what the prohibitions are? Oh, absolutely. I think okay. the outreach process and the application process needs a lot, a great deal of educational information attached to what it means to be a commissioner and what restrictions. You're going to have to actually sign that you understand all of these restrictions and criteria that are placed on you as a commissioner. Thank you. Councilmember Park. And I just have a question about the way this is worded. We're running the blackout period or the inability to run from the date of their appointment. So if the commission is gonna be a 10 year period and we're running their inability to run for another elected office from the date they're appointed, that's 10 years. It's not really a blackout period after their services cease. And, and if we're gonna do a, sort of a hybrid commission length where they're active in the first few years and then inactive but subject to recall, is that still part of the blackout period where they can't participate in running for other elective office? It seems to me that the period should start from when their duties as a commissioner cease, rather from when they're appointed to begin serving those duties. Although, although the, pro the problem is solved if you go to the language that you just can't run for a seat where you've yeah. drawn the lines. Because yeah. then, then you don't have to worry about the time limits. Because I would also argue that the but, time limits are a little messed up because you actually are running for a seat prior to the 10 years for a seat that you haven't drawn because you start running a year and a half before the seat. So all of that goes away if we just have the simple language of you can't run for a seat that you've had a role in. Well, but they all draw all the maps and they all vote yeah, on so, all the right. maps. So, so can't, effectively, right. they're all barred from running for office. They're all barred for so from long as for those maps exist, yes. For, for so long city, as the maps exist. City office, as long as those maps exist, right. Cause, well, cause maybe even, we just say that. Yeah, that's what we're that's saying. What, yeah. No, so, it, it, and that's a good point because you could, any of these commissioners could still run for city attorney or mayor. Yeah. They just can't run in districts that they drew because there would be no conflict in running for other offices. There's a conflict if you help draw the district. I don't know, there's no conflict there? Okay. I don't know. They can't take city lines. 
Can we? You can't change city lines, but you, but you can influence who you're, uh, maybe it doesn't matter. This is, yeah, I, I mean, angels on those. It really is angels on the head of the pin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. <laughs> and we got a lot to cover. So. Should we add an additional time on that? So we're saying they're going to, they're going to serve five years with a five-year option because of anything. Should we add a two-year, but you cannot run for two years? So it's, it's actually 12 years because that 10-year puts you, you know, there's an active new district there. And so then you can run in the next, maybe it should say the, so. n the next, I think we're taking all of those time, those fixed time dates out of the equation, so they're no longer relevant. If it's only, it's only the whether the boundaries that you drew are still the legal boundaries. If those are no longer the legal boundaries, then you know whether that's five years or ten years, it's it, the 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 point to a specific period of time is no longer relevant. It's is that the legal boundary of the district that you're running for? Well, how does right? it happen that it's not the boundary you drew? Um, every 10 years, we go through redistricting. So every 10 years, it'll automatically be a new set of boundaries. Or there's a, a court challenge on the interim, and there's a new set of boundaries that are created. And as a commissioner, you're not involved in the if court you, boundaries? If you are read? not involved in drawing the map boundaries at that point, then... And how yeah. is it that you are not? Because you've resigned. Oh, okay. Or, yeah. I think, yeah. We'll, we'll, okay. um, I think we have the direction. Take this we will take it, it and we'll evaluate whether there are any consequences. Okay, let's we move didn't. on. Next. Okay. Um, persons, um, blah, blah, blah. DC commit, D5C commission shall be uneligible for a period of five years beginning from the day of their appointment appointed to another city commission. So if somebody's a commission, a redistricting commissioner, should there be a restriction on them being appointed as another commissioner, a commissioner to another city commission? Yes, is the short answer. And I think, you know, five years, Common Cause said four, five makes sense. It aligns with, um, well, it doesn't align with the prohibition on elected office, but. Yeah. Okay. You had a four-year restriction, four years on the front end from being a commissioner. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This also includes um, being paid staff or consultant to a city elected official. Yeah. Or to receive a bid. So, again, it's this question, is um, somebody leveraging their role as commissioner and drawing boundaries? I don't think four or five right. years makes much of a difference, but okay. I, I think simplicity, you know, is helpful, so maybe correlate the front end and the back end okay. uh, prohibitions. Okay. Commission duties, I think those were pretty yeah. self evident. If the commission is seated for 10 years, identify additional duties to be assigned, if any. Yeah, and, and most of these, you're going to report back to us actually on that based on what the county and state do. Yeah, okay. Um, ex parte communications. Um, so the, the common cause recommendation is, is very simple. Um, commissioners are not allowed to talk to anybody outside of a public forum about redistricting, about drawing the boundaries. Um, it's very comprehensive um, ex parte communication uh, ban. Um, the discussions about the map drawing are only held in public hearings. Um, and y you could be less restrictive than that if you have some other criteria to be used in that place. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, I did. The ex parte thing, um, I see that in terms of restricting all, but I think it's there's something to be said for um, online participation, social media, and, and I think I'd like to see us find an opening for uh, public conversation outside of you know, what would, would be considered ex parte communications, but in a public way through you know, it, 
because it, it's a great way to to engage the public that people are are familiar with. So if if a commissioner wants to hear from or respond to uh, anyone about redistricting and what they care about, that they're able to do so through a very public online forum where everything is captured. Um, I feel like that meets with the spirit of of the concerns about ex parte communication, but um, allows for a new way to to communicate that that is currently disallowed under the ex parte discussions. Uh, is that clear, or did I just muck this up? Judging by your face, I, I mucked it up. So I'm, let me let I'm, me try. I'm again. actually interested in hearing what the other members of the committee see. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, I think I, I get what you're saying. Like some organization decides to hold a town hall and invite the commissioner to come to the town hall and the commissioner expresses their viewpoints about something at the town hall meeting, let's say, a virtual town hall. Well, yeah, virtual, or, or even if people want to comment to that person on Facebook or on Twitter or something and they want to write back and say, thanks for saying that, this is, you know, I'm curious about what you think to different groups and then people write in. Um, all of that is, as long as it's public, it's not a private server or something to that effect. Um, that's good. I mean, that, that, that adds to discussion, which may not, you know, may not be able to happen within the realm of a, of a hearing. I just don't know how you guarantee that it, be, that it remain public because any, no social media is fully accessible to everybody. I mean, you can if you know the right place to go look for it, but there could be a whole discussion going on on, you know, somebody's um, TikTok account that, you know, none of us have any idea about unless you go and specifically look for it. Right, but, and, but, but it is discoverable and it is public. I mean, we have to, this, I'm, I'm throwing this out, I don't have the solution, but I just, it, it, uh, I do feel like we're kind of caught in the past on this and that, that a lot of this democracy happens online and through forums and that there should be some way, and I haven't figured it out, I'm just thinking yeah. out loud again like we're doing in this committee, it's an unusual approach, um, that we ought to enable some of that, even if it's to create a public, you know, allow folks to create public forums where they have it, or, or if someone wants to go speak to a group, a group invites them to talk about this issue, that, that it be done online uh, and be done publicly. So, so this it, does in provide... In respect, I'm um, A-OK -okay with being stuck in the past. I'm A-OK -okay with saying, you know, sorry, if you want to have a role, show up at the meeting, talk to the commissioners, talk to all of the commissioners, and make your voice be, be heard that way. Because, you know, the other thing that, that a that that approach leads to is picking and choosing commissioners who hear different things from different groups and they're not all hearing the same information together which you know presents all kinds of potential challenges i mean i, I it, it does present challenges but it does also allows folks to reach out to groups that aren't part of the process that aren't going to call into a meeting that you do want to talk to that yeah. you know that you can reach you know it's I understand the thinking it's going to be segmented to these small groups that we don't want them to have an undue influence. But then on the flip side, I think about all of the folks out there who are disenfranchised, who are never going to call in, who could be reached and brought in, uh, but done so. I mean, the whole purpose of limiting ex parte communications, in my view, was not that everybody heard the same thing. It was that, that people don't do things outside of the public eye. And if you do these things publicly, there's a, there's a written record or a video record of everything you've done. So that... So um, this does, this language does allow for presentation, uh, for educational presentations to the public. So that's, that, that starts to get to a little bit of what you're saying. I think the concern is legitimate that there are lots of places that are public on the World Wide Web that are very easy to hide in. And so it's easy to claim that this is a public forum, it's on the, on the web, and yet if you don't know how to find it and Google hasn't figured out how to search for it, you're not going to get there. Um, and now you're, you've got a very limited audience that is having a direct communication with a commissioner on what the boundary should be yeah. that may not be 
actually. And may, maybe if any of those meetings or forums happen, they have to be posted yeah. on the public website or something. I, I don't, I'm not, you, I want to create it so that everybody. You're then bringing it back to the, the commission um, outreach and in, in information process where that is now a posted public meeting of some yeah. sort. Well, it, yeah, I, I just want to add to Mr. Blumenfeld's comments. Like, it's not that hard to say what platforms things can be on. Like, you can find every, everybody, enough people can find anything on YouTube. Like, it's not that complicated. Um, obviously, if a member seeks out, in order for someone to appear on an online platform that no one can find, they have to be trying to do that. The, the big ones are pretty obvious to everyone, including the media. I mean, you know, we had an experience where something went up on Reddit and it was in the paper of record within 24 hours. Um, I, I just, it's, it's hard to buy that it's that complicated. But sorry, but that's not, the, that's not the point, really. The point is the discussions about redistricting should be in the full light of day in front of everybody in the public, not just those who are, who are skilled at finding things on Reddit. The entire world should be able to see this discussion and everything that goes into it, and that happens at meetings. It doesn't happen in, you know, on TikTok. It just doesn't. Even though, yes, theoretically, everybody could find it. I couldn't find it. Uh, you know, somebody who doesn't have internet access can't find it, and they're excluded from the dialogue then. That's not right. We've seen it again and again where some online survey or something is only distributed to select places, and then you get the most absurd nonsense feedback into that because people didn't have access to it. We've seen it in this council chambers many, many times. And then, you know, the, the proponents of that online nonsense say, well, look, the people say this. Well, the people don't say that. It's just that the people who were invited to participate in that social media, you know, venue said that. So uh, I think in, you got to draw a bright line here. No ex parte communication, period, with anybody under any circumstances. It happens in meetings or it doesn't exist. I, I think anything that varies from that is, it's, we, will, we will not be able to sell to the public that anything other than that is an independent process. You know, I mean, theoretically, uh, you know, they're, 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 look, there are Public Records Act things. I mean, you could say, well, yeah, we had emails, but it's accessible through the Public Records Act. Well, that doesn't make it public. What makes it public is, you know, somebody standing at that microphone speaking to the commission and having the commission all hear it and say, you know, we, I agree with that speaker. But, it, may, sorry, oh. sorry Councilmember. I just wanted to say that I think. Uh, we have, I have never, before I ran for office, I don't think I ever came to testify at a city hall meeting, any committee meeting ever. Um, and I was a very civically engaged person, uh, active in my community in all the ways that you would want someone who was participating in debates around redistricting to be. And I do think the, the emphasis on physical meetings and showing up at physical meetings and waiting for public comment periods as a means of participating in these discussions cuts us off from having a lot of meaningful discussions with people who don't have the capacity to do that or who just may not even know about it. And so, you know, I think I, I, I hear you on the question of, of, you know, having spaces that are, um, potentially difficult to find online um, and that, that not being open to the public at the same time, I do think we have to be careful about preventing our commissioners from being able to speak to a broader swath of the public than has traditionally been engaged on these questions. And the simple answer to that is have all the commissioners do it. Then it's not an ex parte communication. You want to have a YouTube, YouTube forum? Have a YouTube forum. You want to have everybody you know, communicating on the same social media platform? That's fine. All commissioners at once at a noticed meeting 
can do that. They can use any means of different com communications, but they have to be doing it together. The, the point of ex parte prohibitions is you don't want picking and choosing commissioners who have certain information or don't have certain information. And you want the public to be able to see the entire discussion that, those, that goes into those commissioners making their decisions. And the public won't see it. If, it's, if some commissioner is off having a discussion you know, with some group on some social media platform, the rest of the public is not privy to that. And that's just as bad as having you know, some lobbyist show up at you know, their home and say, you know, I think you should do this. It has the exact same impact. No ex parte, I'm, 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 I'm an absolutist on this. Well, no ex parte communication, period, by anybody to anybody. Let, well, me, let, let me just poke a little bit at uh, the, the point that Ms. Brahman is making. I can imagine a scenario, we have particular challenges in redistricting that are not shared citywide, uh, but uh, mean a lot to a smaller subset of people. So let's just take Watts, for example. Watts is controversial every single time. There may be three commissioners that want to go to Watts and hear from people in Watts, but the commission may not want to have a full meeting. It seems to me that those people ought to be able to go to Watts, turn on the camera, have it on YouTube so everybody can see. And we could re even require that it's on the city YouTube channel. We could require that. They should be able to go to Watts, three commissioners, four commissioners, two commissioners, have a full discussion with those folks, get input that everybody can see and walk away and not be restricted to the topics that the full commission wants to hear or, or the number of times the full commission wants to hear it. And I, I just think you attract more participation in that way uh, again, because you're going to the place and instead of making the people come to you. Um, and, and it's just hard to buy that people can't find out what happened. If, again, we could set the parameter. It's not only on YouTube, it's on the city YouTube channel that is on. And there's a link for that on our website. Yeah, and just building on that, because this, this is exactly what I was thinking about yeah. bringing this up, is that just like with ethics mailers, when, when you do a mailer as a candidate, over a certain number of people, you have to post that mailer on the ethics website so everybody can see it. I could see something similar here where if you have a forum, uh, you have to post it on the website that is for the redistricting commission so that everybody can see it. It's much better than just reporting that you met with some group and then you're wondering what was the discussion because the discussion would have to be either transcribed or video, if it's a video discussion, or, or uh, available to see on a website. So I don't know that it's, I can view this as still having an absolute ex parte ban, but redefining what ex parte communication is in the sense that if you have it, that discussion, but you have it in a, in, a, in a format that is accessible to the public and accessible to all commissioners, um, then it would be, it will be okay. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that, Mr. Mr. Chair, if that, fee, you know, you keeps your, your, uh, your, your, your ironclad no ex parte communication, but we just kind of redefine what it means uh, as long as it is, is clearly publicly available on one, you know, it has to be posted in a very particular place. Let me, let me, let me give uh, an example. Um, the, the last redistricting commission had multiple meetings of subcommittees of the commission that were not public, that uh, predetermined the outcome of many of the maps because of standards that they developed in those meetings without any public input. And, and that, that was the tail that wagged the dog for the rest of the redistricting process. And, you know, those three commissioners who go out on, on a field trip, you know, are in much the same kind of situation. Could that information be made accessible to the public? Maybe, and maybe there's a way that if it truly is fully accessible to the public and to the entire commission, 
you know, I, I just, then, then maybe that, it, maybe you, you count that as a meeting. Maybe that is then a, a Brown Act meeting or something. But, and that's the other thing. The, you know, the Brown Act applies to all of this. And so the more we do of this stuff, of this outside stuff, the more you're going to raise significant Brown Act issues, significant CPRA issues, um, that I, I think, I, I get what you're arguing would be gained, but it seems to me we can gain the same things by just doing more robust outreach. Yeah. Just do the outreach. And then, you know, people can participate in this meeting either by showing up, by teleconference, by, you know, whatever. But, you know, at some point you have to say, citizens have an obligation to make an effort if they want their voice to be heard. And if the effort is they have to log on to a virtual meeting or they have to show up at a meeting, then make the effort. You know, sorry, we can't, you know, spoon feed everybody with this. And the risk of having non-public communication with commissioners, to me, is it way outweighs the, the benefit that you get from that additional uh, kind of interaction that you could just do by having more out outreach. Yeah. Could, I, could I ask a question? Yes, about this, which yes. Is in the issue that you brought up about Watts, how would I, as a commissioner, if I was serving on the redistricting commission, learn about an issue that the commission was not thinking about and bring it to the table? I, I would, would imagine that? somebody from Watts would call in and say, you know what, here's an issue in our neighborhood that you should know about. And here, but and the commissioners it's, can't bring it themselves. Take a trial, for example, where a site visit is called for you know, at a trial. Three jurors don't go out and visit the site of the murder. If they did, it would be a mistrial. But you can get the entire jury to go out, and un if, when there's circumstances where something like that would be called for, then you know you notice it as a meeting and you go out there. But um, this this gives me a high level of anxiety uh, because. Here's, here's the bottom line. Look, however we define our terms, somebody is going to grossly abuse this. Mm -hmm. Somebody somewhere is going to figure out, well, I formed a community organization, and here's what you know our community organization is doing. And they are going to find the loophole in whatever language we draft, and they are going to abuse this situation to try to... to create inequitable information to the commission. And, and that's my concern. I, 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 what we're talking about is all well-intended stuff. I'm worried about the person who's not well-intended, who's going to try to use these opportunities to evade the Brown Act, to evade the CPRA, to evade you know, public meetings laws, and, and, and produce a result which we're very deliberately trying to avoid with this entire process, which is, cre is to create independence. So that's my concern. Yeah. I mean, Mr. Bloomfield. Sunshine's the best disinfectant, as uh, Supreme Court Justice is known to say. And, and the more we can make sure that all of this is daylighted, uh, we can avoid that problem. I mean, I still worry about their, the way people interact. I mean, the, the, I mean, look at this meeting. We have eight people here. Um, the way people interact is, is very different these days and, and people not only don't have time to come to meetings, but a lot of people would be participating if it was an online forum where they can, they can you know, look at it when they want, they can, they can chime in when they want, uh, and groups can react as long as it's public and as long as it's, it's clearly, for me at least, as long as it's very clearly linked so that everybody can see it, all the commissioners can see it. It feels like it's a it's a positive. You can go to these, you know, a little outreach goes a long way. Then just notice it as a meeting. It's it, that's the simple solution. Notice it as a Brown Act meeting. There's a Brown Act meeting that's going to take place at you know some intersection in Watts where there's a specific issue. People show up or they don't show up, but it's a noticed meeting that way. Well, but then you need so, to have a quorum for well, Brown you Act. Have to, you need to have a quorum to act. Yeah. But you don't need to have a, a, a you know, quorum to go and hear from people. 
So we, just like when we have committee meetings, we don't always have a quorum at our committee meeting. We don't take an action, but we can still hear from the members yeah. of the public. We, we do, in a, lang in a language here, recommend a distinction between he public hearings and public meetings, and that's exactly to that point. You can have a public hearing with fewer, without a quorum. You're taking testimony. The testimony will be, be available to the public. But ultimately, on this question of ex parte communication, if I understand it correctly, the point is that when commissioners are making decisions on boundaries, they're making decisions on boundaries based on publicly available, understood input that they've received that's on the record. And debate among and, them. And debate yeah. on those decisions. So if information is coming into a commissioner privately from some source or from some hearing that the other commissioners are not privy to, but there's a finding being made by the commission that this is where the boundary should be, that's where you're really getting into the trouble of what ex parte communication is trying to avoid. You want all of the commissioners to have access to the best available information when they're drawing those actual boundaries. And that's not just from elected officials, but it's from all sorts of other organizations and people in the community who may have some particular reason why they want a boundary in a, in a certain place. And so, so if you're not careful on how those sorts of information are coming in and out, then you're in trouble. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up um, because you heard the legitimate thoughts about how do we use technology better, how do we use different means of communications better, how do we ensure that all voices are heard. If there's a way that you can come back to us with some recommendations to achieve those objectives while not running afoul of the concerns that I've raised about Brown Act and so on, um, there, there may be some solutions there. Maybe, maybe there is, but the, for me the key is ensuring that every member of the public and every commissioner have access to every communication. Because if, if, as long as that's the case, it's not an ex parte communication. You know, if, um, you know, we could go party at Rob's house and that would be okay, you know, as long as it were noticed and everybody got to come. Um, but if, it, you know, if it's any group of people who are going there, and hearing from Rob, but the rest of us don't get to hear from Rob, that's not right. Tec technical question on that. Um, if you notice a, well, well, one first technical question, does this, the way it's written, prohibit a commissioner from looking at any post on Facebook uh, that might mention redistricting? No. No. Uh, would it, it, would you be able to Brown Act a, a social media and say we are going to have a, a, a public forum on social media and you know have it be open-ended I think it's going to depend on the uh, on the venue okay so you could you could do a Brown Act okay this this Facebook yeah. page is going to be for commissioners and people everyone can interact right I th yeah I think so because if, if you could do that, you may be able to... If there's to a way to document it and it's so on the public a, record. This is a good point that you're going to have to take a sharp pencil to because... Um, sorry, I don't mean to pick on you, Rob, but uh, I see that you're, you're on your phone right now. Let, let me just use, I, let I me just use this example. I was wondering who Rob was. No, let me, just use this, <laughs> let me just use this as an example. So somebody is posting stuff on social media, right, right now. About, right now, about what's going on in the redistricting commission. You're right, everybody could see that. Do, does that become an ex parte communication? It, it doesn't feel like that's an ex parte communication, but, it but is. is there a difference between somebody posting it on Facebook and somebody you know, DMing somebody? Or yeah. so, you know, yes. then all of a yes. sudden, yes. Yes. then yeah. all of a sudden, that's a different thing. So, so some of this is definitional, right. I think, and you're gonna have to figure out how do we encompass um, and the ability to hear the most possible voices yeah. while still preserving the, uh, you know, the integrity of the idea of meetings and the Brown Act and the CPRA and the ability to debate. Okay. So when we come back, we'll see if we can get, refine okay. that. And I wasn't okay. suggesting DMs should be, direct messages should be allowed. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. please. 
Is there any way? Hello. Oh, yeah. There. Uh, there, there was a time I worked somewhere, and I was advised to have no social media during that period of time. Could, and so we all had to, all the employees cut their social. Is there a way that we could have the commissioners not have social media? We, presumably you could do that with commissioners, but the, the issue in reverse would still be there, which is that the commissioners would be reading other people's uh, postings, which... No, they don't have it. They don't have access. We, we have to shut them all off. Ooh. I mean, I, that, I don't think we'd be able to do that. That'd be hard to enforce. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to enforce, and, and it's just, this is a bias towards uh, broadcast and print media, because mm -hmm. I don't think we would ever consider anything that says you yeah. can't read the newspaper, right? And so it, various people will opine yeah. in the newspaper, but, you know, Mr. Kwan has to opine, opines on social media, which, which, um, which we read. I, I just, again, I think um, we've talked a lot, but I, it's, it's clear we need a, a guide path out of this. I have a, a related but unrelated question, and maybe it's for the city attorney. How much of this can be structured so that the restraints of the Brown Act aren't um, impediments to getting <coughs> input? So we know the Brown Act is a still is is there. It's a still thing. We know what the requirements are. Is are there ways that we could not um, walk right into the problems that it presents with regard to getting feedback? So that's the city attorney question. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer is it depends, right? So I mean, keep in mind the Brown Act applies when you've got a majority of members communicating. So. Um, I think that my office should work closely with the CLA on this because, for example, Mr. Blumenfield, your suggestion about what was effectively an open forum but where the members could also be posting raises Brian Act problems, right? So this is complicated and uh, you can thread your way through some of it, Mr. Harris Dawson, but not all of it. Okay, so members, have your staffs order lunch for you. Um, if you haven't already, we've, we haven't made oh, as much progress as I would have hoped by one o'clock. So let's, John, I need you to focus on what you think is, are going to be decision points that this committee has to make right. and kind of skip over the stuff that's less controversial, whatever is less controversial, we'll be advancing forward as part of the big package and then we'll take it apart I'll at just, our next meeting because we're not going to be able to If, if I don't think it's controversial or need, if I don't need any direction from you, I'll just jump by. Um, but I do, have to, I do have to stay on ex parte for one more moment, um, unfortunately. The question is whether it also applies to staff of the commission. So I think in particular the executive director and the map maker should have a higher level of, of standard with regard to ex parte communications with elected officials in particular. Um, but we know that the rest of the staff do need to be working with other organizations in terms of um, scheduling hearings and sche scheduling testimony and there may be other communications that might be considered ex parte communication bans if we went too strong. So it seems like there needs to be some refinement on the staff side of this as well. Who else would that encompass other than the executive director and the map drawer and the, the data cruncher? Yeah, I think those would be the key. Um, if there's another, you know, higher level management person in the organizational structure. I mean, anybody who's going to give direction to the map maker, I think would be, we would want to um, have a higher level of communication control. But we'll all work with city attorney on where we think we can put that line. Okay, yeah, I, again, from my perspective, it should be as all-encompassing as, as we can do it, consistent with their ability to still be operational. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I think we've done a lot of, we've done some of E. We're going to be going back and doing a, a fair amount of work on the application process um, based on the, the conversations earlier. Um, the names would be posted for public review. 
and the public can register concern. We talked about having a uh, review and appeal of that. Um, the f it'll be a two, a dual selection process. So the first process, the first step in selecting commissioners um, will be random, but there needs to be a geographic element to that. If we're, I think our recommendation was that we um, basically select half of the commissioners through this random geographic process. And then the other half would be selected by the commissioners who are selected through the random geographic process. So 17, half of 17 is eight and nine. So if you select eight by geography, you could have eight geographies. So you select one per geography, or you could have four geographies and select two per geography. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think the go. latter makes more sense. Uh, first of all, because the, the, it should be roughly equal population areas. Um, it's easier to divide the city into four population areas probably than eight. And also you have redundancy by picking two people from each of those areas. Yeah. Anybody else have a thought about that? So for the first cut of eight people, you would do it in four geographical regions. Ideally, they would be regions that are already um, yeah. defined in some way. I don't know if we have anything that would define, even if you use planning I've got areas some. or something, they're probably not population uh, equitable. So. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at the, the details of how we might implement that. Yeah. But Ms. Rama. I just wanted to make one comment, which is for me, looking at the question of geography and how you pick candidates, um, it's hard for me without having specifics on what geographies those will be to be able to make a comment on, on this question. Um, and I think we do need more specifics and recommendations. This is one way in which you could do it. Here are the geographies that would result. And then I think we'll have a better sense of what that process would look like. I don't think that would take too much additional work to say that. Like, for example, what are the groupings of the community plans? I don't know. I've looked into a little bit of this, but I don't know how many residents live in each community plan district. I tried to find that for a couple after our uh, last discussion, and then uh, it was a long process, and, yeah. and I stepped away from it. Yeah. Um, I just need more specifics here before being able to be confident in, in talking through this. Yeah, that, it would actually be helpful um, because, you know, there are some idiosyncrasies about the geography of the city. Yes. You know, the, the valley has 40% of the population, but if you want to include San Pedro in any, anything, there's only one way that you can make a geography that starts in San Pedro and, you know, encompass. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> which way it goes, whether it goes toward the west side or whether it goes more towards, you know, downtown. The, the, but it's idiosyncratic is, is my point. And so the commonality, like in the Valley, we feel, I think, more sense of um, a distinctive geography, but it's too big. And there's only two planning areas in the Valley compared to, I mean, if you were to use the planning areas, the Valley gets majorly short shifted. So you don't, I would not support using the planning areas at all because of that reason. So we'd have to come up with some other more equitable distribution. Yeah, I was saying earlier they have to be population equitable. Yeah. Maybe you start with planned area commissions or something and then you adjust it. But that's to okay. Councilmember Rahman's point, just let's see what that looks like. And, okay. and the demographics of the valley looks Take really different. Them. Sure. Look really different based on going from south to north. Yes. You know, and so you, if you have the valley as one geography and you have two people coming from it and they're both from the southern San Fernando Valley, valley which is significantly less diverse. Yeah. You know, just, just things. Anyway, we can, yeah. I think you have a sense of what, we, uh, what I need at least in order to be able to make this decision. I think Councilmember Hernandez echoed that. Yeah. Um, and I think there's questions from yeah. everyone here on this. One, one of my concerns that I would look at was that if it were four, for example, that there would be an additional criteria that you can't have two people from the same zip code in that larger area. So there's, there's some kind of a geographic spread so you don't get two people from the same media community so that that might deal with some of those geographic con components as well. And there, there are ways to build that into the system. Um, okay, and then the second step 
would be um, the commissioners who were selected randomly would pick the remaining commissioners. And that would be based on balancing out uh, uh, several factors, including race and, race and ethnicity, sex and gender, sexual orientation, profession, geography, um, and if there are any other factors that you would include on that list. That way the, the commission, when they're, the, the selected commissioners are ensuring that there's, um, there's diversity among the full commission once the full commission is selected. And they would be making that, that selection out of the pool of the candidates. Any questions from, nope. Okay. okay. Just that we, we may want to add a few more things into the diversity pool. I mean, age being one of them. Age, okay. We do throw in the, in any other factors the commission may consider, but yes, if you have any others that you would add to the list, that would be great. And those, any other factors would have to be decided by us now or would be decided by the commission? The commissioners would pick it at that point. And that's one of those issues where in, tw in 2042 or 2052, we don't know what the mm -hmm. significant factors will be at that point. So okay. that gives them the leeway to consider new information. Okay. Okay. And then we took all of the um, commissioner removal information that we had received and consolidated that into a simple um, or, or more straightforward process. Um, so it would require a two-thirds vote of the commission to remove a commissioner, and they would, um, and the reasons would be such as a neglect of duty, gross m misconduct, inability to discharge the duties of office, failure to meet uh, commissioner qualifications, um, unexcused absences, uh, transparency violations, moving out of the city, these, these kinds of issues. Um, there would be, um, and so there would be a process basically so that if there's a concern, it would be in front of the commission to consider that. The commissioner who was uh, subject to removal would be able to address those concerns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we then have a situation where somebody might be charged with a serious crime or felony to allow the commissioners by super majority vote to um, um, go to a removal process. And then finally, if a commissioner pleads guilty um, or no, um, to a felony, that they would be immediately removed. Um, and we highlight the pre-removal processes, notice of hearing, opportunity to respond in writing, and opportunity to respond to the notice public hearing. So. Ms. Ms. Hutt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it, the felony piece is convicted of a felony during their, yeah. during their um, As commission. A Only that, yeah, that period of the- It's not a no, prior, not prior. paid rest. Okay, no. Thank you. Just a question, why would you need a vote if they are convicted of a felony during their time of, um, um, sorry. Not if they're convicted. If they're charged. If they're charged. So that's, you know, the, the court hasn't completed the evaluation. I mean, it could be if, if they're charged with a felony and you felt that should be a, a reason for immediately removal, immediate removal without a vote of the commission, then you could certainly do that. But this gives um, at least an opportunity for that person to address the, the matter on a charge. Ms. Hernandez. Thank you, Chairwoman. And why are we talking about charge and not conviction? What happened to innocent until proven guilty? That's the next item. If somebody is actually convicted, that C would be immediately vacated. Without a vote? Without a vote for okay. a conviction. That's so the, the only situation that would be an immediate vacation. And that's consistent with our charter language right now for elected officials. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Um, so the mapping criteria, um, I think it's pretty straightforward at the top to comply with the Constitution, Federal Voting Rights Act, state constitution, and that each district shall have a reasonably equal population with the other districts, except where deviation is required to comply with federal voting rights. So that's that standard, the Common Cause, the LA um, Government Reform Project and RLA all affirmed that criteria. 
the next set where we get into some mr uh, Wickham, what uh what number was that that you just went over right now f1 okay thank you yes and then from there um we get to the additional criteria and that's where there's a wide range of uh conversation we included in our list um, lots of different concepts that we had found in other jurisdictions or had been raised um, in different places. The um, three groups had presented, and in our report, we recommended that they not be ranked, that they be listed as subjects for the commission to consider but that the commission would decide what the priorities are at the given time. And again, that goes back to this idea of we don't know 10 years, 20 years from now, what the highest priorities will be at that given time. And if we set those priorities up in the charter at the top of the day, then that restricts what they're, uh, they're considering. <coughs> the um, other groups provided indications of what they thought were their priorities and they ranked their priorities. So the question are, the que two questions are what to include and should they be ranked or should they be unranked? Um, and I don't know if this is a big, this is a big um, area of conversation or maybe it's not. For the language of the charter, it seems to me that the redistricting criteria is what's required to make legal districts. Other criteria um, should probably be left up to the commission. I, you know, I think for purposes of the charter, we define this according to what we're required to do under the law in order to ensure compliance with the Voting Rights Act and the Constitution and so forth. Okay, and then we could, we would probably add, um, include language that other criteria is appropriate in, in the charter and then leave the commission to, to identify what those are. What would be appropriate for the commission to yeah. consider? So this is where we get to um, concepts like contiguity, um, community of interest, and um, compactness, uh, factors like this. Um, oh, the, okay. okay, so for those things, um, I, I actually thought those were already required under the decisional law under the Voting Rights Act. Um, they're, they're, some of them are tangent. I mean, the, you get there through the Voting Rights Act, some of them, but all of these um, models that we've seen have actually called them out specifically. So the, some of the Jingles criteria, for example, um, are um, a substitute for contiguity, for example. So. Um, our charter currently identifies neighborhood council boundaries in, in trying as best as possible to keep those intact. Um, none of the other groups recommended or identified that as a criteria. So um, you could, you could um, do what we did with uh, um, disqualifications for a commissioner and point to the California um, Election Code and the California Fair Maps Act, which identifies all of these criteria. And so that might be a, a more direct and simple way so that there is room to vary it, um, but it's pointed to in state law. I think for, for those sorts of factors that have always been considered part of the redistricting process, it probably makes sense to specify it. Okay. Um, but I, I don't have a strong feeling about ranking them or, or not. It's, it, for those sorts of factors, I, I don't know one. that one is particularly, whether contiguity is more important than compactness, I, you know, I don't know. It, I don't know that it makes that much of a difference. And, and the more prescriptive you are with these things, the harder it becomes for people to draw fair maps. You know, that's at the, at the end of the day, you want to pick an independent commission and then kind of entrust them to do the best they can to create fairness in, in the drawing of the maps. So long as, you know, I mean, a measure of compactness and certainly contiguity. Contiguity, in my view, should be, should be required. 
Okay. The, the, the others, um, you know, uh, they should be goals, but not at the expense of, you know, the, the other elements. Okay. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing this. I'm just talking out loud, I'm thinking out loud. So members, any other thoughts about this? Go ahead. So in our write up, I will focus on the traditional factors that have been included in this area of additional and then, and the California election code. And then we'll see where that goes. Yeah, I, maybe specifying those traditional factors and then leave it and other factors that the commission, you know, wishes to consider that are consistent with the law. Perfect. Councilmember Hernandez. <clears throat> Thank you, Council President. Um, Mr. Wilcom, I have two jails in my district, Men's Central Jail and Twin Towers Jail. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it, if that is taken into consideration in this particular bucket, because I know that there's been state legislation that's been talked about that's allowed folks in jail to vote. Um, but also I know that there's a potential proposition coming down from the state um, around voting for people who are incarcerated. Yes. So the census file we use is the PL 94, Public Law 94 is the, is the file that we use. State law requires that if the um, address of somebody who's incarcerated is known that the state will assign that to a census block and then the population in that census block will be adjusted and we're obligated to use that PL 94 adjusted file that's adjusted for the incarcerated population so um, by virtue of complying with state law, we will absolutely be using the file that is adjusted for incarcerated people. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I think I know where we're going on that. Uh, G1, so I think just in general, I, we have an easy answer and a hard answer for this next section, public meetings and public comment. Um, there, state law has requirements for public hearings and public meetings at different phases of the map and then um, you can be more uh, prescriptive about that or not and I and so we originally had language that um, started with those provisions in state law and guided the time frames etc cetera, etc cetera. and then there was some concern that we not be prescriptive in the charter because the Commission will come along and do what they need to do as long as it's um, a minimum plus more. So in this section, we're, um, we're, uh, we're following the state law requirements. We're um, adjusting it a little bit to include not only the preparation of the draft map and the final map, but also the principles that lead to drawing the maps in each case so that there will be public testimony and public hearings and, and public access to those decision-making processes and that there will be time in advance to um, notice the hearings, that there will be multiple hearings, et cetera. These sections also require that materials be provided in language um, required under federal state law um, with the best effort to provide them in other languages that are active in the city. <laughs> We're with you, Mr. Wickham. All right, ready to move. Can I move on? So the um, H1, is, the final map shall be adopted. We'll be placed in here September 30th of a year ending on one. Um, state law requires um, 205 days before the um, next election, but a charter city can have a different date. Um, 205 days puts it at the beginning of August. And so if the census data come out in April, on April 1st, that gives you April, May, June, July, four months to draw a map, 
how a draft map, a final map, and go through all of the public hearings associated with that. So um, Thank you. we put um, September 30th to give the commission an extra two months to do that whole public review process. Um, Common Cause recommends um, staying with the state required 205 days. Uh, our LA um, recommended um, September 30th. Does the 180, yeah. does the 100, 180 days give you enough time? Um, that's the, uh, I, I think from our experience, it, it's 205 days. Okay. I th we think that's not a, enough time is, is our experience. Okay, what is, what is that time that you think is, would be most appropriate? Um, so we have September 30th. Our charter currently says December 31st, so our, our charter actually adds an additional three months on top of that. But the, that, main, that creates some issues with the, co the county registrar recorder and their ability to activate the map for the next election. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to balance between the county's technical requirements and the state law. Mm -hmm. So September 30th is kind of in between. Okay. Um, commission, the quorum of the commission is simple majority. Um, re, we have in here as a term that it's a simple majority for all um, votes, except for the vote on the final map would be a super majority. And then, as we noted earlier, um, removal of a commissioner would be a super majority vote. Um, So again, the map principles um, would be part of the pu public process. Um, Supermajority on a vote, supermajority, final map. We, s we do need to work on some um, language still um, on the impasse provision, so we'll, we'll take that back. Um, final map uh, with their report is submitted to the city clerk, and then it would be um, effective, well, we gotta talk about the effective date. Um, but it would not be effective any sooner than that when they submit it to the clerk. Um, in the section I, records and data, they'll comply with the Public Records Act, the Brown Act. Um, they'll keep minutes. All records of the commission relating to redistricting um, are public records. Commission shall make available to the public a free electronic mapping tool. Um, we want to make sure that all of the data and all the geographic data and all the tools are available to the public and the commissioners um, to everybody um, and that there's training attached to that. State law requires that the map, um, that the redistricting website be set up and that the redistricting website be available for 10 years after the redistricting commission completes its work. Um, so the effective date, and this is going to be not a problem if the size of the council is increased. Um, it, it will be something that might be an issue in the future. Right now our city practice is that the effective date for a map is right after the council votes to approve it. Um, if the size of the council is, yes ma'am, sorry. Where are you on the rack up now? I'm on my own planet at the moment. I know it's on the list. 26, 27? Is it I6? No, I... I lost it. Seven? H7, yes, I should know that. H7. Thanks, Alex. H? On this one? H. Oh, H7? Page 27, H7. Awesome, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the way we drafted it here um, was what we originally included in the CLA report. There hadn't been a lot of public comment on this. And then we saw the Common Cause recommendation and that triggered some uh, new concepts. So 
Right now, our map, when we adopt it under the advisory process, is that it goes into effect immediately. Um, some jurisdictions, including the state, have the, f the map go into effect along with the, up the next elections. So the new boundaries are not in effect until after the next elections are held. And, and the impact of that, and the impact of that that would be in the city of Los Angeles is that there may be a period of time when people have two elected representatives or they have no elected representatives. That's the, that's the complication associated with delaying the effectiveness of the map boundaries until the, and aligning them with the elections. And there are reasons for this, um, whether they're relevant or not, um, that's for some other discussion. But those are the two milestones that you can look at. In 2032, if we are increasing the size of the council, you, you would have all of the new boundaries go into place at the same, same time it, at that point because you would be moving to 23 council districts. And you wouldn't be doing that any sooner than that time. So you can delay the implementation of the new boundaries until 2032. After that, you get into this issue of you know, are the maps effective immediately or do they go into effect in alignment with the, with the elections? And so we should clarify what that should be. Can I, can I go back a beat or two? <clears throat> two thirds of 17, is that 11 or 12? It's because it's, it, it's 11 point I need to two just, something or other, it's which rounds down to 11, but do we say that it has to go up to 12? It's rounded, it's on page 10. Oh, all right. Um, 17, two thirds is 12. Okay, so you're If you wanted right. three quarters, that would be 13. Right, no, it, it's 11 point We round, you cannot have you, a point I got you. No, something, it, right. It's a decision, that's all, okay. Yeah. So that's fine with me, but. And then the dates that change, the elections change too, right? Because we have presidential year different. So does that, when we're picking a date, but the elections on the other end are changing, does that impact us at all? In 2032, it would all line up. And the, the timing, the election but issue is more 20, 2042, it won't. Huh? 2042, it won't. Well, it won't, I mean, the presidential election isn't a factor in this. Um, it, it's the, tran the transition is actually, on this question, the transition is an easier factor. Um, in 42 and 52, et cetera, it's just a question of is the, is the effectiveness of those boundaries in place? When is, when is the effectiveness of those boundaries in place? So what is the advantage of having them be in place any time prior to when the new person is elected to them? There's, um, people already have, people who are already in office are thinking about those boundaries already and they're probably, um, they may be providing services in, in those contexts or not, but um, that's just off the top of my head. I haven't given a lot of thought. It's, it's just what we've done. Ask a question on that, because uh, for me, uh, the effective date depends in part on whether or not we are going to straddle the elections uh, across the the redistricting line. Meaning, if we're if we're going to do with the New York model, which we talked about, where on the the redistricting year everybody is up for office, that's one thing. Because then it then it's a real clear break. Okay, you you represent this area until this day, and now everybody represents a new area. But if you're straddling it, and there are members who are going to have another two years representing the the old district, then it becomes very problematic because you could have you know, it, it becomes problematic because you have people who elected to a new district that didn't exist, but you have people still representing the old district, or now they're in a new district that they didn't get elected to, representing people that didn't vote for them. So. So in 2032, it's not going to be a problem because we're going from 15 to 23 and everybody's going to be on the ballot and it's going to be a simple and direct shift. If you decide that the model is that going forward, every 10 years, all the council districts will be on the ballot in the redistricting year, then um, 
you again, it's simple. It's, it's you're simple. not right. going to have a problem. Right. Your problem is more on the side related to um, the length of a term and term limits. That's exactly that's what I was saying. That you said it more clearly, but when I was talking about straddling, that, that's exactly what I was right. concerned about. So, so that. The affected, I mean, the two are like, they're separate issues, um, frankly. The, if, you, if you want the effective date to be tied to the election, you could do it either way. It, you have all of the, all the districts on the ballot every 10 years um, following or aligned with redistricting or not. The state does not. Right. And the state has this weird transition right. period I, where people I guess are what not I'm I would feel differently about answering this question depending on the answer to the other question. If that makes sense. Yes. So, so if we're doing the New York model, then I'm very comfortable having the elected official represent <laughs> that district until the end of that term that they were elected to, and then everything starts anew on the date of. If we're straddling, then I think I, I would prefer switching the dates at the moment uh, to that be immediate. The lines are done. Okay. So for me, it's it's very situational I dependent. Think New I, York. I, sorry. I don't understand those, what the New York model versus yeah. straddling is. Okay, it, sorry. The New York model, or do you want to answer it, John, or you want me to answer it? Well, we're, I was looking to Steve to help me answer this. My understanding was that New York does, puts all of the districts on the ballot every 20 years. Oh, I thought every 10. So my, my, my misinterpretation of the New York was that they, was what I was basing it on, so that's why I'll jump in. Yeah. I, I was under the impression that every 10 years, um, they basically redraw the lines and uh, everyone is on the ballot because you're elected for two years or four years, depending on, on whether you end in zero or yes. two. Um, that's what I was referring to as the New York model because every census, you have a complete break. Everyone is, uh, yeah. is up for, for, uh, for election. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely doable. And um, you could do that here, and so that every 10 years, everybody's on the ballot, and then you would make your redistricting boundaries effective on that date, and that would be great. You just need to um, address the term limit provision charter um, to account for that. But other than that. Right. And if you don't do that, then you're doing what I was referring to as the straddle, which, which is where you're having a member um, elected to one district, um, and then their district gets changed in the middle of their term, yeah. and now they're serving a different district. Yeah. Yeah, and it's my understanding the state is comfortable with that, and the state is um, um, strengthening that kind of language. You mean for, for, the, for the state senate, you mean? Yeah. Right, because the assembly, it, they don't have the problem because... It's every two years. Right? It's every two years, so it's, and the senate is, frankly, it's kind of messy. You have people representing areas, some members being given more, mem more district uh, because they're not up for election. I, I think there's all sorts of legal problems with that. One person, one vote, all the rest. I'm not the courts, I, nobody's suing on that, but I'm just saying that, that seems to me like a mess. Yeah. Why, why can't you simply say that uh, all district lines become effective upon the election of the first election after the redistricting? So even though it's only half of the districts that are on the ballot, everybody's new district becomes effective as soon as those members are sworn in. Yeah, that, that would be another way to approach it. But then, then you have this odd situation where you're, I'm representing District 3, and if I happen to you know, not be on the ballot, they renumber the districts. Now I'm representing San Pedro, and somebody else is running for the district that I represent. But because I was elected two years ago, I'm stuck to go represent Pedro. Nothing wrong with Pedro, folks, but wherever. Um, and that's, that's a, a wacky situation. And then, you know, it pretty much assures that that's the end of, that's a two year, that person's termed out at that moment. Which is why I actually like the New York model, as crazy as it is, because it also avoids the, the numbering problem. I'm, I'm, I think the numbering problem is a big issue, bigger issue than we make it out to be. But by having everyone on the ballot for the redistricting year, or what I thought the New York model was, um, 
then the numbering is no longer an issue because you are going to run for the seat that is in the area that you represent. It becomes a little bit of a tricky thing when you deal with some of the you know, AB 1290 monies and we deal with discretionary pots of money. That'll get a little messy, but um, that's going to get messy anyway. But at least there's a clean, there, there's sort of, you don't have that problem of being, of someone being redistricted to another area because everyone is free to run for wherever they feel that they represent. Okay. Um, so the so the first question then I have a feeling that we're um, so the first question is whether the all of the districts on the election on the ballot every ten years. If the answer is yes, then we don't we can make the maps effective at that point. If not, then we need to evaluate whether there's um, any impact of having all the elect all the maps effective on the first election afterward, whatever those impacts might be, and then we'll come back to you with an answer on all of this. And just to next. sorry, just to confirm, it is the odd districts that would be impacted during that election cycle, correct, Mr. Wickham? Um, in thirty thirty two. All districts will be impacted. The odd districts are impacted first in 2030, and then the even districts are impacted in 2032. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming that we're doing council expansion, yes. then the, that first election, everybody would be on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But if we don't do that, if we stick with the current number of council members, then it would be a different situation. Yes. Well, not necessarily. If we we could keep the number of I'm not saying we should. We keep the number of council members the same, but we could switch to a system of um, you know the four year, two year term, the New York model, so that you don't have that issue of redistricting. I don't. It, it's not linked to the number of districts. It's very brief. Just in the four year, in the, where you have the two year terms, so does that mean then with term limits, your total potential term limit would be 14 years rather than 12? Or would it be 10 years rather than 12? Under the current formulation of the charter, it would be 10 years. Thank you. But we can change that. Could I? A couple questions. Um, when council expansion was last considered, when back in 1999 or so, was there any discussion at that point about an adjustment to the election cycle? And what was the advice and recommendations, if anyone knows? I couldn't. I couldn't find a transition plan in the, in in the people I asked um, couldn't. Um, point a, to a transition plan to me. There's one other document that I need to go back and try and track down to see if I can figure out what that was. I'd be curious to hear um, what prior discussion of that issue was. And then if you don't right. mind, one more question. Um, instead of creating a scenario where there are certain council members that might have a two-year two odd term, um, how, have we given any consideration instead maybe to a six-year term for odd districts beginning in 2026 and then even districts beginning in 2032? That's a configuration I haven't seen yet. Um, I would have to give some thought to that. Could we? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because you, you can't do a six-year term any later than that Right. because you run into redistricting. And I just, I think for any of us, a, a two-year term it, it is really a challenge to deliver constituent services and to do the things that we need to do, just given how slow and yeah. big the city is, especially if we're talking about adding more voices. Yes. Especially. 
or to be part of this too. And that would apply to all districts in 26 and even districts in 28? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Park. I, I agree with that. Um, I, to, to have to run again after two years, it just breaks up a lot of what we have in motion for our districts. So I, I like that option. Also, uh, Mr. Wickham, um, what happens right now when someone, for example, fills a vacant seat? Does that count as part of their term limits or the terms that they serve? As long as it's less than the majority of a four-year term, it does not count. Okay. And does majority of the term, does that, is that more, anything more than half? It, yeah, it's less than half, so less than two years. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so there could be some corollary between a two-year term and filling an unfilled term. Got it. Thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, I'm getting a lot more work out of this than I expected. <laughs> We're engaged, Mr. Wickham. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm moving through all of the E, I mean I's, on page 28, page 29. Um, the, commit, the mayor and council will provide sufficient funds. And I think the idea is to base it on the the John, budget yes can you move the other mics the, the two other this mics one. that are yeah move them oh, away that's where that's coming from maybe that'll all help. right um so it would be based on the 2021 commission adjusted by cpi i think would be the way to go and then future budgets would that way it would be a fixed budget um and then see, there would be a statement that city departments that are supporting redistricting would receive some some funds as well um, I think the K items are pretty clear. They would hire their own staff. They would hire their consultants. Um, they would be a designated employee under state under the, um, K point five. Oh, yes. yes. Hold on one sec. Comes from around. Question about J. J. Sorry, are you? I heard you say funds equivalent to 2021 commission proceedings adjusted by CPI, but this says a difference adjusted term. Okay. So what? Do you have a preference with either of those? I mean, to me, the suggested term actually seems more robust. Okay. Um, it sufficient funds. I, I to don't the have a sense that the 2021 commission proceedings were adequate for outreach for Good broad point. public participation. It was during COVID. You know, it was kind of an unusual uh, commission for many reasons. But um, I would just say that I think we should be considering this with an eye towards creating something that feels robust to us now, not basing it on the commission that just completed its work. And so I prefer the suggested terminology. Okay. Terrific. All right. Um, K, so K5, um, the committee had actually spent a fair amount of time looking for ways to um, allow the commission to uh, recommend, recommend, um, recommend revisions to the charter on independent redistricting and then to have that reviewed by the ethics commission eventually to be brought forward to the, com to the council for consideration and the committee had wanted to use the model for the that the ethics commission uses right now for revisions to the charter on ethics issues and so we replicated the, that that to the best of our ability At the end of the day charter changes require a vote by uh, you know approval by the voters um, but again that's based on the model that's currently in place for the ethics commission With regard to uh, legal counsel, the options are for the city attorney to provide legal counsel, for the city attorney to um, pr uh, use their authorities to bring in outside counsel or to clearly state just up from the front that the commission will obtain independent counsel. And so the commission would do that on their own. That's all they do. And that was a recommendation from the LA Government Reform Project. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council President. I think that's that's a good idea. 
um, just to continue with the independent process of this because we are the city is a client of the city attorney so I think it would be good if there's a way to have that independent representation as well okay okay great we're almost at the end um, the commissioners would receive compensation as um, defined in the administrative code and then actually it, could, yes. could we go back just one second yeah. uh, to the representation part um, because I agree with council member Hernandez that it, it adds an extra layer of independence if it's not designated to be the city attorney <clears throat> but what I was uh, th there it could be that the commission itself um, decides that when they put this out to try to find legal representation they're struggling to find anybody that has the expertise who wants to come to work for the city who doesn't want to be conflicted out for further representation and so on so the last of your recommendations there says that it provides the commission with the authority to choose their legal counsel, which could be outside counsel or it could be the city attorney. Um, would you, th would the members feel okay if the commission got to decide that rather than us? So that, because I don't know what eventualities there might be in the future about the availability of counsel. So that, that way the commission could decide, could use outside counsel if they choose to outside counsel and if they, don't find anybody that's suitable or that for whatever other reason they want to use the city attorney they would have that option as well but it would be up to the commission I don't have a strong feeling about it I just I, I have a I have a you know what if they're not really getting a lot of good applicants to do this work do they have to put out an RFP you know do they hire from our city bench of outside counsel I, I don't know what the mechanics of that would be yeah. and there's probably limited amount of expertise on this out there in the legal world. There's probably only a handful of firms that really have any kind of redistricting experience. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If at that moment they, like there's not barriers for them accessing one decision or another. Yeah. Like if that moment yeah. they wanted to go to the attorney, that's great. And if they wanted to seek outside counsel that they would have an RFP process, yeah. whatever resources they needed to make it happen. If that would be the idea, yeah. Okay, it's entirely their choice on how to proceed. Okay. Um, okay. And then the last is the City Data Bureau. And um, we're, we have a uh, you could create the city data bureau today if you want it. Uh, you don't need anything in the charter for that. Um, but it might be helpful to have a little bit of language in the city in the ch city charter on the data bureau to um, ensure that everybody in the city is providing um, data and support as is needed by the city data bureau. If if we don't need it for the charter, don't clutter the charter. Let's just do it. This is my view. Okay. Right, it would be great. It would be really great to have a city data bureau. Let's just do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm done. <laughs> all right members any other thoughts shall we go back to the issue of picking a number for the size of the council I think we do kind of need to come to some closure on that so that um, at least at our by the time of our next meeting we have a comprehensive a relatively comprehensive group of recommendations councilman Brown can I make a proposal um, based on what I heard from the committee during that discussion uh, which is 
could we get some of the answers to what Councilmember Park was asking about in terms of office capacity and office budget and staff? Um, and at Councilmember Park, I'm, I think I'm not doing justice to the questions that you asked, so feel free to jump in um, to add what I've missed. But uh, for a, a, a few different options of, of uh, the number of seats, um, 23, 25, I would include 30 there um, and come back. And also the question I heard over and over again was this question between the legislative and executive authority of the council. And I don't know whether we just would be discussing that here or whether the CLA would have any input into that and how that would function. Um, but I would like to consider at minimum the questions that answers to the questions that you asked and how it would function within the city itself um, with at least those three numbers at minimum. And, and if I could just add to that, to me, Please. one of the things that is really important is the impact on city departments, their capacity and their budget. We put in a lot of requests for studies and reports back and I know that that takes time and resources, so I, it, I think that is an important piece of the, this, this discussion, and I need to have an understanding of that in order to make yeah. a good choice here. Absolutely. So the numbers, I, I think you said 23, 25, and it's either 29 or 31. That's You're not right. 30. Sorry about that. Uh, 31? 31. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't think I have a strong enough feeling at this point to oh, yeah. to okay. say before we hear from hear that back that we need to make a decision. But go ahead. Also, wanted to add the question that Councilmember Hernandez brought up, which was the part time versus full time. Council okay. Member. How are we getting mm. more horseshoe tables? Mm. I'm sorry, but what would be what would the answer back be? Because whether they would make. There is no council that has a council as big as us, even let alone bigger. So there is no there is no analogy uh, to to draw. But other small cities do have part time councils. So the, the, all I'm saying is the two issues are distinct because that we don't. There's no analog for even as we are right now, let alone uh, a bigger council. And, At least and not in California. And there's a lot of issues when you start talking about, I mean, I'm always open to any ideas, but I'm, I'm, I'm very strongly believe that we need to have a full-time council for a lot of reasons, ethics being one of them. Um, mm -hmm. But so I would take that as a separate issue. Obviously, we can, we can consider that. And we'll consider anything, but I, I'm, it's hard to get me off that mark. That's, I pre feel pretty strongly about that. No, I share the same concerns. That's why I asked that question because yeah. Yeah. if there's more of us, does that make us, you know, shrink our time? So that's that's why I asked. So, so it's it's kind of the flip side of what yeah. Councilmember Park said. It's council members' capacity as well. If you have have more of them, that's all. Was, I think I was just trying to be uh, respectful of all the questions that I heard during that. Yeah. Thank you. These are going to be discussion. Some, some things that are going to be maybe hard to quantify but they're central to this because this discussion really is about what what is what do we envision a future council to look like you know it's not it's not just picking a number it's actually what is the function of the council going to be and all of these questions go to right to the heart of that and they're we're inevitably going to have to deal with the consequences of of that so um Appreciate that, those points. Okay, so we're going to defer that uh, resolution. I, but I think we've made some progress in giving you a little bit clearer definition on at least some of these proposals. Um, yes, absolutely. So we will take the information we've received today. We will refine the suggested term sheet. We'll prepare it. We'll also confer back with the other organizations that um, have presented on some of these issues just to get some, see, see if we can find some clarity and, um, you know, alignment on the outstanding issues. 
and um, we'll do the additional research that you've requested. Yeah, it, 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 it had been my, my hope that we were gonna get to the point of actually having votes on some of these things, but I think you have a greater sense of where there is consensus on many of the issues. We will better be able to respond to those that we haven't yet once we have that input. So if you could make sure that we get written input from the from the presenting agencies as well as all other community groups who uh, or or interested parties who want to provide it. Council Member Bloom. Yeah, and again, I throw that out for interested parties that we, we do want to know what those sweet spots are for different groups where they think they wouldn't be diluted with a certain number and where representation that sweet spot between more representation and non-dilution, uh, which you can't directly research, but again, I put that out there to folks. Um, also, I don't know that we landed on the um, the decision. To tell me if we, if I think otherwise, to pick a number versus picking a few choices. Um, whether we, you know, we could still do, and I know that's what they did last time, and I know it, it didn't pass. I don't know that that was the the cause of, cause of it not passing, but. Uh, I'm still unsure of what's better to do, whether to pick a number to move forward to the ballot or to pick two, three choices to move forward to the ballot. So the instruction that I have is, is that we'll do an analysis of 23, 25, and 31, and at that point, from the ballot question side, you'll be, to, you'll be able to decide, do you want to put 23 and 25 on the ballot, or do you want to put 25 and 31 on the ballot? I think the analysis that will be coming forward will help you all make that, dis that decision of what the ballot approach looks like. Yeah. I'd put 21 on that analysis, too. Not that I'm pushing that, but just to get the, the, the panoply of, of choices. Um, and then we could choose whether we want to put multiple ones on the ballot. And, yeah. and then the other thing, I mean, I know we'll take this up in a separate meeting, but we do need, a lot of these decisions I think are gonna be exactly the same that we do for the school board, but we should be starting that process if we're gonna keep up with the timing on uh, these very same questions for the school board. Actually, that would be helpful. Is, is it, the, it is the instruction from the committee to look at the size of the school board and um, the same type of analysis of what size of the school board would be appropriate. And I'm gonna just throw this out there not to open up even more cans of worms, but we are in the process of proposing amendments to the charter. One of those amendments might be that we get out of the business of drawing the districts for the school board. <clears throat> because the only reason historically that we've done that in the past is because the school board used city election infrastructure. When we ran our elections, the school board contracted with us to run their elections. Well, we don't run our elections anymore. The county does. So there's, I can't think of a good argument to make as to why the city should have any role in redrawing those districts or deciding I, I how big the school board is or anything else. I can think of one, which is the majority of the school uh, school aged children at the, that are overseen by LAUSD are, are Angelinos. Not all of them, but, but not certain, all of them. But certainly, the, certainly, majority, and, and someone has to look into it in the sense that you're talking about seven members represent, I mean, their, their districts are obscenely large, um, not as obscenely large as the supervisors, which they're whatever the word above obscene is, is the supervisor's <coughs> district. Um, but that there is a logic there that just that it's it's in our lap so we need to deal with it but i agree with you conceptually there should be a different body i just don't know what that body is or and, and whether we have the luxury of waiting to figure that out yeah, it, well right so i'm not suggesting that we should just abandon the school district and leave it as is uh, but but i'm but i do think since we're going to the ballot and talking about this with the voters we ought to, you know, consider whether a, a proposal to have the county do this process, for example, rather than the city, which is not contiguous with the district, um, should, should would be more appropriate. It's 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 an option. I'm not right. staking and, out a position. I'm just saying there's no logic to our doing it at yeah. all. But the county is also bigger than the school board district. Yeah. So that that that's also out of whack because then you have people from Long Beach voting on, on this. So, so we'll take a look and, and just confirm the process for redistricting under whatever the other governing 
methodology is for school districts when they're not included in a city charter. One of the benefits or one of the abilities of having them in the charter is your ability to, to change the size of the, of the board, to apply city ethics rules to the board, and other governance factors like that. So that's something that's actually in your control and control of the voters. My inclination is if it's, if it's there and we have it, let's, let's exercise it and deal with this issue because okay. it's a problem. But, but we are, uh, I understand the committee wants us to evaluate these questions. So that's, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, Councilmember Member Hatt. Thank you so much. And do you mind repeating the, <laughs> the, the uh, report back that you'll give us on what staff sizing looks like, what, you know, you're going to do different scenarios, right? So if we go to 23, what does staff sizing look like? Uh, in addition to that, is it, I don't know what the process is to expanding staff across the board for services in the city like DOT or sanitation or any of those things. How, how is that examined and determined? Uh, that would be through the annual budget process. And so? Yeah, and then through the different policies that you're considering over the course of the year and your developing program. Yeah. So will we be able to see a side by side? We'd have to do that in independently. Yeah, I, I think um, to Ms. Park's question, we would look at how the an increase in the city council would impact city department staffing levels. Um, but I, I mean, this is something that is going to take a little bit of time on our end to figure out how we're going to measure that. So um, we'll we'll evaluate that. Thanks. All right, members, anything further? Um, I, there's really, I don't think, any need for us to have to vote on anything now. You have uh, the, a whole list of instructions for reports back. So on, at the next meeting on September 18th, right? September 18th? Yes. Okay. Uh, you'll come back with a refined version of the rack up that will actually be beyond the rack up. It'll be as many concrete proposals that we've helped to define today as you can. Whatever questions are still remaining to be reported back, we'll take up then. And then the remaining issues that are dependent upon those reports back will be taken up for votes at that meeting. But it's important that that meeting encompass actual votes on the actual proposal so that we can have plenty of time to put something out there in the public before council gets it uh, a month or so later yeah absolutely and that that is ex that's helpful and at some point looking well down the line when council adopts the the term sheet or whatever it looks like, then the city attorney and the city in CLA would go and draft the actual language and, and those documents will come back and there will be some wordsmithing for the committee at that point too. So we, you know, we can see several months worth of work um, on all of this going forward. All right, very good. Anything else members? Any other questions for Mr. Wickham? Thank all you right. Mr. Wickham, thank you. Thank you, John, good work. Madam Clerk, is there anything else before us? The desk is clear. Very good. There being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.